The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the express written consent of Spaced Out Radio or Spaced Out Radio Limited is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. You experienced Step right there the mountains of British Columbia to you listening around the world. This is Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. They let us play with all our toys. They let us think that we're big boys. They let us make a lot of noise but we're the world. They let us think we're Superman. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com on iTunes and tune in. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Are you playing with Bigfoot and aliens again? Uh, Dad, you gotta stop haunting the goat. It's scaring them. All right, seriously, put down the pointy sticks. Okay! Game on! Game on! Game on! Word is. Alright, alright, alright. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Spaced Out Radio. Mr. Bumblefoot, Dave is ready for liftoff. Seriously, Dave? Really? Aren't you a little old for a tinfoil hat? I am. Toby. Good evening and welcome to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, and it's great to have you along for the ride on this Tuesday, April 4th, Wednesday, April 5th, if you're on the East Coast. Hope you all had a great day and night as we are live right here in Uncle Jimbo's cabin, right here in the Great White North, as we are live seven days a week. 
We want to welcome in everyone listening in on our terrestrial stations, WQEE 99 Rock the Key in noon in Georgia, as well as the United Public Radio Network on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We are also live on spacedoutradio.com, on Spreaker, on Renegade Talk Radio, the High Plains Talk Radio Network, and on Revolution Radio. Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, currently of Art of Anarchy, is the man behind Behind our music, Bumblefoot rocks us in and out of every single Spaced Out Radio show. Hey, if you're a social media fan like I am, follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You could follow me on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download our shows from iTunes. We're also on RadioGuide.fm, TalkStream Live, and on Stitcher, Our website is spacedoutradio.com, and you can head on over to patreon.com to become a patron of Spaced Out Radios for just as low as $1 a month. Now, we don't take phone calls on this show, but we do take a plethora of questions from our audience in the chat room. So you have to go to our website, spacedoutradio.com, to sign in for the chat room there, or if you're on Revolution Radio, on Spreaker, on the UPRN chat room, or if you won of the select few in the SOR Space Travelers Club on Facebook. Make sure you type your questions in capital letters so I do not miss them. If you're on Twitter, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio like Eric D. is doing right now. And I will get to your questions and comments in there as well. If you head to our website for 5 bucks a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. We offer some pretty good swag for you guys when you sign up. We also have a brand new news section called The Encounter Online, dealing with everything paranormal. You can check out my latest blog there as well. And if you've had a sighting you can't explain, fill out an SOR Sightlines report. Our researcher, Mike Schmidt, is ready to find out what's going on. Once again, we say hello to everyone listening in on WQEE 99, Rock the Key at noon in Georgia, the home of the walking dead. We're also live on 107.7 FM in New Orleans, the United Public Radio Network, and over 160 countries around the world. Good to have you with us as well. We're live in Las Vegas on Renegade Talk Radio. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. Tonight, one of our most honest and credible guests is back with us as Dracula novelist Ian Holt joins us once again to talk about everything paranormal, from the ghosts themselves to the way Hollywood portrays the spirits of the dead. Yes, we're even going to get into the musical side of things as well, from drinking blood and biting the heads off of bats like Ozzy to death metal and thrash. Let's get into it. Raise your horns, people, if you like some very loud guitar. Hell, What's rock and roll without a little bit of thrash and gore anyways? The idea of evil spirits reigns high on the list of people who want that buzz of a scare or thrill. Sometimes it's just an addiction to the suspense that keeps people going, whether it's on the small screen, big screen, in a book, or plugged into their ears. Ian Holt is back with us tonight. Welcome back, my friend. Good to have you along for the ride. It's going to be a fun and entertaining show once again, as it is always with you. Hello. Hey, buddy. How are you doing? Hey, there you are. Hey, <laughs> dropped out for a sec. Uh, good to be back. I feel like uh, it's uh, a poltergeist. They're back. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? We always got you going, my friend. And I got to tell you, you were quickly becoming a fan favorite around here. And when I post up that Ian Holt is going to be on the show, you would not believe how many private messages and public messages... I get from everybody saying, right on, Ian's back. Let's get into this. Let's get into this. Oh, that's great. Well, I I am a a fan of the fans, by the way, just so you know. The feeling is absolutely mutual. I've actually quite noticed lately that a lot of our listeners on social media have been hitting you up quite a bit on your posts. I know, it's great. How does that make you feel, man, when, when you get the audience, you know, uh, coming from this show and all of a sudden wanting to interact with you on social media, keeping an eye and tabs on what you're up to? 
I, I love it. I, you know, that's why I do this. I, I love the interaction with the fans. I'm, you know, uh, I, I, whenever I do a movie, I'm always thinking about what are the fans are going to react or when I'm writing the novel, what, well, how am I going to excite them? How am I going to surprise them? How am I going to entertain them? I guess I'm an entertainer at heart because I, I, that interaction with the fans is what it's like. It's like heroin to me. I love it. I love interacting with them. I love talking to them. So it, and it inspires me to do more and better. And uh, their input means everything to me. When they, when they ask me questions or they're interested in the subject matter, it, it, it fuels everything I do and just inspires me to do better. You know, I, I have to admit, uh, you know, as bad of a term and analogy as it is to use the word heroin, a lot of people have asked me, well, what's it like doing the radio show? What do you get out of it? The absolute high I get out of doing this show on a nightly basis is, to me, better than any drug. It really is better than any drug. I mean, i gotta, I got to be honest with you. I don't know if you know this, Ian, but, you know, I've talked very openly on this show in regards to, you know, how this show helped me get off my medication for depression and anxiety. And I've been two years now, over two years now, med-free, and it's all because of the positivity this show brings and the high that it brings, the energy rush that it brings. And like you said with the fans, it's the interaction and being there with people every single night. You almost start to get used to who they are, and it, you almost feel like you're starting to know them. It, that's true, and you know, it's such a different connection. It's not in person, you know, um, and that's a shame, but I'll tell you the truth. When I'm at Comic-Con or I'm in public places, usually there's a time limit. I have to move to the next place because I'm on a book tour or a movie tour or, or um, I'm going from one panel to another at Comic-Con. So in between panels, people are running, rushing up and try, you're trying to talk to seven people at once. And then uh, your manager grabs you and yanks you away. Come on, it's time to go. You know, and you, you lose, you kind of feel like you're letting people down or something and you feel bad about it, but you got to get to the next meeting. Well, on radio, you have that time to talk and explain yourself and, and on Facebook and all of that, you get to answer people's questions fully, you know, and have a personal relationship with the fans, which is just fantastic. You know, it, it's a, it's a way of me talking to people. I'm not one of these people that like to hide from from the fans you know it's like oh buy my buy buy tickets to see my movies but then don't bother me in public you know that's i i know what the deal is you know the deal is you're you're the fans are responsible for me doing what i love and in, and it's my responsibility and my pleasure to give my time back to them because i couldn't do what i do without them and realistically no matter what we do on the entertainment side Without the fans, without the listeners, without people making that that emotional commitment and investment in what you are doing, you got nothing. It doesn't matter if you have a movie like Shia LaBeouf, whose movie opened to one viewer in France the other day. I don't know yeah. if you if you read that story or not, but or whether or not you are actually taking the time to get to know your audience and saying hello to them, whether it's on the show or whether it's on social media. Yeah, I mean, I don't get people like that. You want to be in the entertainment business, but you don't want to interact with the fans. And it's like, how do you figure that? I mean, going back to the beginning when there was no film and all of that, there was stage, and you were directly interacting with your audience every night. And and if you're on a TV show or in a movie or or on radio or whatever you're doing, you even in baseball, baseball, Derek Jeter used to talk about this all the time. He used to talk about how people feel like he's part of their family because he's in their living room every day. So when fans come up to him, he feels a responsibility and understands that you're in their lives. They talk about you around the dinner table. They talk with you amongst their friends. When the movies come out, they debate them and you're in your living room every day. So you, you have to take on, you know, that you have to take that on when you want to go into the entertainment business. If it's not about entertaining, what are you doing? You know, what is it? It's, it's not called narcissism. It's called entertainment. 
You know, <laughs> I don't, I don't get guys like that, that, you know, want to beat up everyone that walks up to them. I, I, I don't get it. <laughs> you know, it, it's antithesis to what the business is all about. And, you know, we see that a lot in professional sports. We see that in a lot of movies. I'm sure everybody can name a few actors that just have that ego. You got a great Jack Nicholson story. I don't know if you want to share that or not. Oh, sure, yeah. I, I, I was uh, dating a girl who was head of uh, um, A&R for Atlantic Records, and she took me to the uh, Grammys. And I'm sitting at a table with uh, John Bon Jovi and his wife and Sting. And sitting across from us uh, at the back was Jack Nicholson and Dennis Hopper. And uh, I, I was a huge Dennis Hopper fan. Forget Easy Rider, just Apocalypse Now. I could do all his lines. So I, and he had just done that movie with Kiefer Sutherland, uh, Flashback, where he kind of played the same guy from Easy Rider. So I walked up to the table to talk to, not even to talk to Jack Nicholson, but to talk to Dennis Hopper. And uh, Dennis was the nicest man. He was like, we almost did a movie together. He, he's a great guy. He was such a good guy and uh, so much fun to talk to. And Jack Nicholson sitting there looking at us and we're ignoring him. And he says something to the waiter and he, and he looks at me and he says, yo man, why don't you sit down? <laughs> so I sit down at the table. The waiter comes back with a bunch of shots. He goes, we're here, kid. You're going to do a shot of Jack with Jack. <laughs> and we did Jack shots. And then he, and then he talked to me for like a minute or two. And then he was like, okay, kid, now I want to talk to my friend. So you can go away now. <laughs> Jack Nicholson was incredible. It's a, it was, you know, so I could say for the rest of my life, I did shots of Jack with Jack. It was incredible. And the funny thing was, I was doing I was doing Yellow MTV raps at the time, and uh, I can't think of her name now. The one who did all the interviews, the uh, Latina um, interviewer. Oh my God, I can't think of her name now. But she used to see me up at the at TV offices or at Cinetel where we used to shoot Yellow TV raps, and she always see me in the hall, say hi, and she kept kept coming up to me and my girlfriend at the time asking who are you? Should I be interviewing you? And I said, you don't know who I am? Well, if you don't know who I am, you can't interview me. And she kept coming up to me. Come on, tell me who you are. You look so familiar. I know you're some, I know, I know you're somebody. Can you, would you interview me? And at this time I was nobody. And, uh, finally when we're leaving, she comes up to me again and she says, come on, you're leaving. You gotta let me interview you. Who are you? And I said, you know who I am. I work with Dr. Dre and Ed Lover. You know, you, you rap. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, that's right. I knew, I knew I knew you. Oh, well, I don't have to interview you. You're nobody. <laughs> I thought you were somebody. <laughs> that's, that's how you start out in Hollywood. <laughs> how did you keep from getting angry over something like that? Because that's the business. It's her job to get everyone that was important and she just recognized me from somewhere, but she couldn't place me, you know? So, I mean, she didn't mean anything by it. Her job, it, you know, she's not there to interview me. She's there to interview Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, Sting and Bon Jovi, not me. You know, I wasn't even, I didn't even have a ticket. I was a plus one, you know, so I wasn't even supposed to be there, <laughs> you know? So, you know, you don't get mad at stuff like that. Cause you got to know the game, you know? Um, the, the the problems come in in the industry is when you get to the point where you're somebody and then the ego comes in, like you're watching feud, who gets interviewed first? I'm bigger than that person. You interviewed him first, so I'm not going to give you an interview. That's when it all starts getting crazy, when all the egos get involved. But when you're starting out, you know, I was just glad to be at the Grammys. I mean, it was a great night. Now, who gets to go to the Grammys when you're out of college? <laughs> You know, I mean, it was, it was incredible. That is that is just amazing. I love that story. And, you know, I was hoping you would share that one on the air because when you first told me that story, I was killing myself <laughs> laughing. I, I really was killing myself <laughs> laughing. When it comes to ego in Hollywood, and we're going to be talking a lot about Hollywood tonight and music and movies and everything along those lines. You know, you mentioned a little bit why that ego is caught. Co- 
caused. But we look at people, okay, and just to name a couple off the top of my head, someone like Val Kilmer or someone like Shia LaBeouf who is, are absolutely getting raked over the coals by the media, by Hollywood, you know, for their bad attitudes and their, they're difficult to work with. Is this just a bunch of publicists blowing sunshine up their butts a little too much, or is this just the way they are as humans, where they think they are bigger and better because they had a backup role in Top Gun or something along those lines? Well, you know, it's different for a lot of people, but the truth of the matter is everyone in Hollywood, I don't care from the most successful person to the lowest man on the totem pole, are all insecure. That's why we're there. That's why we seek this. There's something in our nature where we need to feel appreciated by other people and feel that, you know, love. And um, for some people, you know, that when you get to a certain level, they begin to, it's the line from, it's the line from uh, Young Guns 2 when Kiefer Sutherland says to Amelia Westerville, you're starting to read, you're starting to believe what they're writing about you in the papers, Billy. That's what happens. You got to understand the minute you're nobody. And then the novel comes out and all of a sudden I'm everywhere. And the one first thing you realize is all these people start coming at you. They want to hang on. They want to people that want to be in show business that don't make it or have other jobs and life checks in and whatever they start clinging to you to get a piece of your fame and they feel that. And some people allow those people in and they start becoming your yes people. You're the greatest. It's like grime with a worm tongue whispering in the King's ear. You're the greatest. You're the greatest. You're amazing. You know, and you start to believe that after a while and you think you're bigger than the pictures. I mean, sunset Boulevard you know, it was the pictures that got small, you know, that great line from Gloria Swanson. I mean, that, that's really what it becomes. You start, some people really start believing all this stuff you say about you. For me, when those people came around, those are the people I ran away from because I didn't, I didn't want to be in that position. I'd seen it. You know, I, you know, <laughs> I, I spent my youth following around people like that but not so much to grab onto their fame to make connections. Like, you know, when I was a kid, I followed around Steve Vai and Joe Satriani, you know, because I love their music and they're from Mineola and they were guitar teachers before they were guitar gods to a lot of my friends. You know, I grew up with Dave Portnoy, the drummer for uh, dream theater. He was in all my, he was in my class in second grade, you know? So, uh, he, he's, he's the one who introduced me to, uh, to kiss the first time i heard kiss was when he played it for me when i moved out from brooklyn uh, you know he played kiss for me and that's how i came became crazed about kiss and wound up in a kiss cover band playing bass called the thunderheads <laughs> but you know we used to do shows he was in a band called uh, we were kids i was in the thunderheads and he was in uh w uh uh wd we, uh, WDFA. I can't say what it stands for. It's we don't F around. And, um, and we used to play at the local church here at St. Mary's and then we'd open for them doing, doing kiss covers. So, I mean, you know, when, when you're hanging around with Steve Vai and Joe Satriani, I mean, you know, you're, cause they're in music and I'm, I was just all about film. I never really wanted to be a musician. I mean, I just learned the, what I had to learn to play the songs. I wasn't a real musician. Um, you know, you, you, you get along with people cause you're not after the same thing and it could be a friendship. When I started going to NYU and started, you know, meeting guys like John C. McGinley, we used to work out together. I remember, I remember John McGinley, we were working out at the NYU gym and he said to me, he's leaving for a few weeks. He's going to do Highlander too. And I was like, Highlander is one of my favorite movies. And I was going nuts. I couldn't believe it. He told me he was going to work with Sean Connery and Christopher Lambert. And I was like, oh, my God, it's so great. Then, of course, I saw the movie. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, you, you start getting, 
you start getting connections. Like he invited me to uh, see uh, Riff Raff because he was friends with Lawrence Fishburne and Titus Welliver was in um, Riff Raff. Now Titus and I were friends from classes at NYU with as Philip Seymour Hoffman. And when I did my production of Macbeth that I started and directed, uh, Titus was uh, Banquo and Philip Seymour Hoffman was Macduff because we all went to school together. So a lot of it for me was hanging out with people that were getting, and of course, when he got school ties, Philip Seymour Hoffman and his career took off, may he rest in peace. You know, it was all exciting for all of us. Like, how did Titus Welliver get started? Titus used to bartend with Bruce Willis at the Third Street Bar. So when when Bruce went out to L.A. and got big, Titus followed him out there and Bruce helped him. So, I mean, you know, you start making these connections in the industry. That's what it was about for me more than the, just what we call them fame suckers. You know, so when the fame suckers came around me, I had seen it with other people and I knew I was prepared for it. A lot of people aren't, you know, and especially when you start out as kids, you're told you're great. I mean, Shia started really young, you know, and you start believing what the people say about you and they follow you around. And the funny thing is you head gets so big, you ruin your own career. And then all those people disappear. They're not, they're not your friends. They're not around. So you don't have the light of fame, the fame light on you anymore. And they go away. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it, for anyone in that position, it's a dangerous, um, it's a dangerous kind of life because you, what happens is you start depending on that adulation. And when it goes away, you, you can go to a very dark place. It's, you know, there's a, there was a line in, in feud just uh, last week's episode, Sunday night's episode where Joan uh, Crawford said, you know, it gets, or Betty Davis, I forget which one said it, but it, it gets very quiet when the offers stop coming, you know, and you become your own, you, you become part of your own hell because you buy into these people, which causes your ego to grow, which makes you think you're bigger than everybody that every, then everyone's looking to take you down. And the first failure you make, everyone uses that excuse to destroy you, you know, and then those people go away and all of a sudden you're all alone. That's the dangers of Hollywood. You know, like everything else, everything in life, anyone who's listening, Dave, I'm going to tell you the secret of life. Clint Eastwood said it. Man has got to know his limitations. Anyone who doesn't in this business is going to get destroyed. It's, it's a cruel business. And yes, it is. Unforgiving. I want to get to a quick story here before we continue. Amber in the SOR Space Travelers Club all the way down in Australia. Her and her husband listen to the show every single day down under, and we appreciate you doing that, Robert and Amber. Thank you so much. We always ask them when they enter the chat room, how's tomorrow looking? Because they're, they're kind of ahead of us. And she says, paranormal happening. Sitting here listening to Spaced Out Radio and feeling the couch depress next to my leg. No one is there. you got to love when that happens. <laughs> you know, well, I guess even ghosts like Spaced Out Radio. Well, you know, aliens, too. we got Carl the Alien. Alien? Oh, yeah. That's right. We love the aliens. You know, we can't forget about them. We don't know about Bigfoot yet because we haven't seen him around. But ghosts and, and aliens, yeah, they've been here during the show. It's very cool. Very cool. I have a question from Joe in the SOR Space Travelers Club for you, Ian. And he is asking, a, sure. lot of, a lot of celebrities show up on TV shows telling their ghost stories. Are they legitimate, or are they just trying to get some face time on TV? Um, that's a good question, Joe. You know, um, I don't know. You know, I, I would like to think that it's true, but the ones that show up a lot of times, where they are in their career, it makes me wonder, you know, <laughs> you know? Um, and look, I'm not one to do, uh, begrudge someone getting on TV, but I think 
if you're if you get on TV and you're telling a, st- a lying about a story like that, I think that's pretty low. But uh, so I'd like to believe they're all telling the truth. I mean, you know, celebrities are just like everybody else. I'm sure they've had experiences. So I, I'd like to believe it's true. When you're sitting around your people that you know from Hollywood, whether they're actors or whether they are behind the scenes, do do the topics of the paranormal ever come up, Ian? Around me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I guess because I'm pretty outspoken about it, um, they do come up. And, I, I mean, just for an example, I mean, I have a friend, John Von Herget, who's who may have seen on Facebook is trying to do a show called stage fright, you know, and he was inspired by me and the horror movies and the paranormal and getting, and his love of theater and finding out that so many of the theater, great old theaters around, especially in St. Louis, where he's going to do the first season of the show. There's so many old theaters, not like in New York, everything gets knocked down, but that there's so many haunted theater stories. And there, he even found out that there's a, a light called, you know, the stage light, which they leave on at night for the ghosts to perform on the stage. It's an ancient tradition that goes all the way back to like the 1700s. And it's maybe even the 1600s with Shakespeare. And so there's a long tradition of ghost stories in the theater. And we think that is because it's a place where passions come together. It's a very emotional place. I mean, every night on the stage, passions are played out. There are passion plays behind the scenes, love, romance, murder, death, ego, everything like that. Strong emotions happen there, and a lot of it is left behind. I think a lot of people, you know, when they pass on, so that don't go into the light, find themselves back at the theater. You know, it's, it's a place where they, where they f- experience so much emotion, and the theaters, theater lovers wind up back there. So his whole show that he's trying to raise money for in Indiegogo is about, you know, going back to those theaters and finding those stories. So, you know, in the theater community, I mean, I, I mean, even there's, there's so much, um, I mean, we can't, when you, when we did Macbeth, you can't call it Macbeth on the stage because they believe the play is cursed. So you call it the Scottish play. You never say Macbeth because there's this tradition of the play itself being haunted. So there's a lot of paranormal involved in theater and in film. I mean, look at the curses, supposedly, of the Poltergeist movies. There are a number of movies that had a curse. You know, El Cid had a curse. Now, how many people died of cancer from El Cid, but... They filmed it uh, before they knew about radiation. They filmed it on the old uh, nuclear test site. So, you know, but with Poltergeist, there was a lot of strange deaths. You know, there have been a few movies like that that were called, uh, they were cursed. So there's always been, I think, because of the emotional nature of the film, theater, television business, you know, it's sound stages. You go to Hollywood, you go on different sound stages. There's ghosts all over those sound stages that people talk about. The crews talk about it all the time. Actors talk about, oh yeah, that sound stage is haunted. That's where they they, they shot the Lu- I Love Lucy show. And uh, Lucille Ball is seen there all the time. You know, it's just like you know uh, um, Abraham Lincoln being seen in the in the Lincoln bedroom at the White House. Patty Negri, who is a psychic to the stars in Hollywood, often brings up how many clients that she has. Like, we're talking multi, multi million dollar movie type clients. And yet, she mentioned something that's the same thing that you mentioned the insecurities that go around Hollywood, the insecurities that, that, plague everyone do you think that that type of negative energy in hollywood is is what keeps a lot of the spirits there is that they feel maybe that they have to keep performing in order to keep themselves relevant i think it's i think it's not so much that as the fact that you know we'll talk about heroin again having that adulation is like a drug it and when they die, they're not ready to give it up and they don't walk into the light and they stay, you know, and then they 
by hanging out around there, they draw on that emotion of the of the new people that are there. I, I think some of it is really sad. I mean, you know, I go back to Feud because everyone can see it every week. It's a great show. Um, but the you have two women who are hugely successful, extremely wealthy, and they don't need to make another movie for money. It's they need that fame and they need that adulation and they need that credibility and they need it, you know, and they're willing to destroy each other to or climb over each other to get it in any way possible. And, you know, that's a perfect example and a true story of what Hollywood can do to you. If you let it, you know, if you take it too seriously and you got to realize uh, many people in Hollywood aren't Dolph Lundgren that they don't have five PhDs and can do whatever they want. Most of them, you know, don't have something to fall back on. They, if they weren't working in Hollywood, they'd be working at a McDonald's or at a Walmart because they have no other skills. So, you know, there's a desperation. If you come from nothing and you don't know where your next meal is coming from, suddenly you have a lot of money. There's a desperation in Hollywood too, because we don't get a paycheck every week. You know, we got to get our next gig. We're always on the hustle, you know, I, I, you know, whatever you do, you know, I mean, like I used to hustle porno films. I mean, when I started out, I mean, I was a 15 year old kid and the, uh, the blockbuster and, and Royal video chains were, and I worked at a video store and just like Tarantino and they were closing out all the mom and pop video stores, the big chains. The only thing that kept the mom and pop video stores in in uh working was the porno titles but you know people rent them once they do their thing with them and they don't rent them again so and they were expensive like 200 bucks a pop so i got the idea with my boss i said listen would you take ten thousand dollars and go to the vegas porn convention porn convention and buy ten thousand dollars worth of, of porn videos and then we could rotate them and rent them out and that's how i supported myself when i got to college was Every, every month we'd rotate the movies and we kept all the mom and pop video stores in business. So I, you know, being on the hustle, you know, is something I've done since I've been like 15 years old supporting myself. So I'm used to it. But a lot of people, you know, there's that terror of, I don't get another gig. The money dries up. What do I do? And there's also a lot of idiocy, you know, guys like, you know, he's a nice guy, but you know, MC Hammer bought a $40 million estate dropped, you know, like 70 million into, to refinance, to re, you know, designing it. And all of a sudden realized he had a $4 million a year tax bill and the next album didn't hit, <laughs> you know, and now he spent all his money. So, you know, that desire to, to be big and, and, and all of a sudden be with the in crowd because half Hollywood is all show. You know, the more, the bigger show you put on about yourself, the, the more successful you look, the more successful people think you are, the more they hire you because you're making money. So you put on that show and if you can't back it up with another, with another, with another movie, that's why all the time in Hollywood, you have people, you say, how do they work when they have a big bomb? Because they book their next movie. It's a desperate, why do people do a great movie and then a bad movie? Well, because you book the good movie, but what happens if it doesn't make money? So you book anything they give you, you know, when to have another movie ready to come out. Now, let's say you do a little independent movie and you get like a million dollars for doing it, right? You, and it's awards bait movie and everyone's talking about it. You don't care what the hell the movie is. It's Kong Skull Island or you know, uh, anything, any, any big budget movie that they're going to pay you $10 million for, cause you're going to grab that 10 million. Cause that's going to support you for the next, however, however long we don't know when our next paychecks are coming. So you, you, a lot of times we blame actors for, you know, why you do this horrible movie. Oh, I can't believe he was in this, but it's about, Hey, if you want to do good work, you don't usually doesn't high quality work. Doesn't usually pay a lot because it doesn't have a wide audience. So you have to do the big budget junk to get 
the to get the big payday. You know, a lot of times, you know, you, you not every big movie is horrible. There are a lot of good big movies like the Marvel films, but not everybody gets into those. <laughs> so you have to find something. So you wind up with Jupiter Rising or whatever it's called, called Jupiter Rising or or or, or uh, a Speed Racer or, or something like that to get you to get your big money. Let's get that's, to a question. That's the real name of the game. Let's get to a question from Teresa here. She is saying, Ian, what do you know about mind control or the issues rumored to plague actors and musicians? Ah, well, I mean, this goes way back to Svengali. I mean, it's one of the earliest silent films. You know, um, it's not so much mind control as it, it, it's more like you know, um, what do you call that, uh, syndrome, uh, when the kidnapper, <laughs> you start identifying with the kidnapper like Patty Hearst did, I forget the name of the, uh, syndrome, but, um, people in Hollywood, when you're desperate, you know, you get a lot of people that manipulate other people based on hooking them on drugs, money, uh, you know, promises of fame, you know, um, it, 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 the mind control thing is, it's just like with a cult, you know, if you got a guy who's produced a bunch of movies and, you know, you have a, a young girl run, leaves home Midwest, doesn't have money and she's desperate in Hollywood come to my house, hang out, you know, and you start manipulating that person. And let's say that person becomes a star, you know, the guy is, you know, good at his job, puts her in a movie and she becomes popular. There's a feeling of, of indebt indebtedness and they make you believe that they made you a star and you can't do that. I mean, you know, there was the whole thing with, uh, Oh, what's her name? Uh, the, the singer, uh, but she left her husband, Tommy Mottola. Um, uh, I can't think of her name. But everyone said, you know, with all the actors of The Voice, they said, uh, Mariah Carey, right? They said that he found her, he made her, and then she went off, she left him, right? She went off on her own. Then you have uh, the one who did uh, the song for Titanic, who also her manager made her. She wound up marrying him, but that was a great love story. You know, so there's all kinds of, people that that you depend upon in Hollywood you know and you when someone gets you somewhere you hold on tight because you couldn't do it on your own you know you need managers agents you need producers and casting directors to believe in you you need all that stuff you know um and one of the, the stories for me you know was um you know I worked on uh Mike Sarge's film Personals with um uh, Malik Yova and Stacey Dash. And, you know, the producers, you know, they, they rewrote the ending and they needed, like, it was like a talk show ending and they needed a star. And I was working with Dre and I brought Dre on uh, as a favor to the director who I was friends with, Mike Sargent. And um, the producers were so happy about me getting Dre because they didn't have money and Dre did it as a favor to me. They were out of money. And, uh, when they did the premiere, everyone in the theater was like, that's Dre, it's Dr. Dre, and they started applauding. And, you know, I wound up forging a friendship with the producer, Boyce Harmon, and I wound up working for him, and he became my mentor. And, you know, we had a movie about to go called, uh, uh, what was it, Wanted Men, with uh, Dr. Dre in it. And, uh, we were financed about ready to go. And Boyce had a heart attack suddenly and passed away. And all of a sudden the movie went away and everything went away. And I was left sitting there. What do I do? And the director of it was Bob Clark who did, um, uh, uh, Christmas story. So Bob was also the writer director of children who shouldn't play with dead things. And he's a Canadian. And uh, when Boyce died, the movie fell apart. The money went away, and I was lost, and he was worried about me. What am I going to do? So we got together and decided we were going to do 
the remake of Children Shouldn't Play with Dead Things, and we started putting a script together. And he wound up getting the rights back. And uh, he drove every week from Vegas to, from LA to Vegas to gamble, and then drove back with his son, his 21 year old son, every week, weekend. We get a call Monday morning, it was a car crash, they were both killed. And all of a sudden, everything I had work, been working on was just gone. You know, all my mentors and everyone were just gone. And I had to basically start over from scratch. So, you know, that fear of these people that are ahead of you, you know, there's always the mentor, you know, there's always two, a master and apprentice, right? Um, and all of a sudden, you're back on your own. You're starting from square one. That's the, that's the fear of that that allows the mind control to happen in Hollywood. Let's get to a question from Mario here. He goes, how corrupt is Hollywood with drugs, secret societies, you know, the apparent rumor of the Jewish influence over Hollywood? What do you think? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll put it to you this way. The whole thing about Jews running Hollywood it's not only is it anti-Semitic in a way, but it's also true. The Jack Warners and these guys, and what it was about is a lot of it comes, there was a long tradition in Europe called the Jewish theater. It's, it, it, there, it, I mean, you know, it, it manifested itself here, you know, and, and these people came out of theater moved into silent film when they jumped on the silent film thing and they wound up building studios on it. So the one thing about these supposed Jews that ran Hollywood, they were freaking brilliant because they were not only businessmen, they were also artists. And I only wish they were all there today in the same capacity. Cause what we have now is kids out of Harvard are being recruited by the studios to run them like corporations. So you have all the business sense, but none of the artistic sense that was built from the theater of the streets in Europe to America and the Yiddish theater and vaudeville up into silent film and then, and then talkies that built Hollywood that made Hollywood great as it was. So, you know, while, to every rumor, there's, there's some truth. It's also the fact that, you know, it's not always what it seems. You know, we look at things today and go, well, you know, how does, how, why did they make all the money and not the stars and the studio systems and all that? But we look at every business. The, uh, the purpose of every company is to make money. It's not about having a heart. You know, there are laws and regulations that get passed to curb corporations. That's the big fight in Washington right now over the uh, new Supreme Court Gorsuch because he always rules in favor of corporations. So it's kind of a heartless entity. A corporation is not a person, despite what the Supreme Court has said. So a corporation's job is to make money. It's the job of the lawmakers that we that should represent us, not the corporations that pay for their campaigns, but they should represent us to pre, to put laws in place that prevents corporations from going too far. A corporation is just there to make money for its shareholders. So that the control of the actors and all that stuff and what was paid and what was done was what they could get away with. Over time, laws are passed. I don't blame someone for trying to make money. You know, it's, it's, I mean, even the Stoker situation and the Bella Lugosi, like I, you know, I, I know Bella Lugosi Jr. Uh, you know, he's still suing over what they did to his father. You know, there's a huge lawsuit that he's had going on. I mean, they've been making money off Bella Lugosi's like this. Now, they, Universal will say, we presented Bella with a contract. Bella didn't get his own lawyer. He, he didn't read English, so he just signed it. That's his fault. Today, it's you have to get a you you have to have representation and everybody knows it back then when you come from hungary and you don't speak the language you don't know the laws and the world was a different place back then is it the company's fault 
or was it Bella's fault for not knowing the law and was anxious to get paid because he was broke and had two cents in his pocket and two, two changes of clothes, a suit and a tuxedo. And that tux- cape and tuxedo that he brought with him is the costume he used for Dracula. I mean, <laughs> when he did the play. So that's all the clothes he had. So, I mean, you, when you get that big contract for a movie contract, you sign it because you're desperate for the money. That's another form of mind control. But it's not the corporation's fault or the people in charge. You know, it's like if it's legal to dump toxic waste in a river, then they're going to dump toxic waste in the river because it's cheaper. It's, it's, the, it's the politicians and the lawmakers' job to make sure that that's illegal and they can be sued for it. So I don't blame corporations or the people that run them for, for trying to do best for their investors and their shareholders. John has That's a question. The the game. John has a question in the chat room on Spreaker. He's asking, what about all the rumors of Hollywood's ties to the Pentagon? Well, there are ties to the Pentagon. I mean, you know, look at World War II. You had some of the biggest filmmakers in Hollywood making propaganda films for uh, the war effort. I mean, there's, there's, there's no secret there. Uh, Hitler did the same thing. Lenny Leifenbrenner, the, 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 what do you call it? The uh, triumph of the will, right? It's about propaganda. You know, we, and I'm sure that, that that relationship has continued in a lot of ways. After 9-11, didn't they call in all the filmmakers to start, and writers and, and all that to start dreaming up the craziest shit you could think of to, of how the terrorists might attack because, you know, a lot of these guys get paid to be creative like that, to come up with these crazy stories. But the, the, you know, a homeland and all of that wanted all those scenarios plotted out that they could uh, present countermeasures for the protection of the U S people. Not every, not every connection is nefarious. And I'm, and I'm sure if there are UFOs, we've talked about this, and the government knows about it, it could mean the end of society, if, as we know it, the end of the rule of law, the end of governmental, your people willing to be subjugated by governments, because now we're a planetary entity. So the end of religion, you know, the, the threat of uh, hell is gone. So why do people have to follow any kind of moral code? So... I'm not, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they, if the Pentagon was working with Hollywood to create scenarios and uh, counterintelligence for the American people and the world that UFOs don't exist. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. But not everything is nefarious in origin. They think they're doing the right thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I could see that happening. We only got a couple of minutes before the break here, about three and a half to be exact. And man, that's been a a very quick first hour. Let's start to lead Hollywood more into the paranormal side, if you don't mind. And this gets to Joe's question. And Joe is asking, Ian, do you know what movie has had the most unnatural deaths related to it? He's thinking Poltergeist. I would think so too. I mean, there have been, it's not just, you know, if you really read into it, it's not just the stars. It's people that worked on the films. There's a whole history of deaths, you know, and, and sicknesses and illnesses and all of that, you know, and the nature of the film, if you're the most dangerous other than an inhuman is a poltergeist. The most dangerous form of haunting is a poltergeist. And you can draw them in because they're prankster demons or sorry, prankster spirits so that they come in, you know, with an idea of tearing stuff up from the inside. I mean, and hurting people and, you know, and all of that, they're, they're very dangerous and, uh, they could do a lot of damage. So, you know, doing a movie about, poltergeists if you create that atmosphere you can possibly draw them in i could see it how it could happen you know according to the theories of paranormal and i think you know poltergeist is a perfect example of what could happen 
Now that that scares me because in our next hour we're going to my my partner at Alt House Productions and the writer director of Death Metal's coming on and he's doing a movie. Uh, we're doing a movie about you know uh, the culture of death metal and how that culture can draw in, <laughs> in some evil stuff. So uh, I'll luckily. I'll be on the unhinged set while he's shooting that. So if anything happens, Michael get the Michael get the brunt of it, and I'll be okay. So um, that's one good thing. <laughs> well, you you gotta hope that you know it doesn't go all paranormal on you, and weird and strange things start happening while you were filming the movie. It doesn't matter what movie it is; it does have you know, some implication to the topic at hand. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when we did episode 50, like I said, I didn't have any encounters in the hospital we were in, but a lot of people did. I mean, you know, people woke up screaming in the middle of the night and it was all kind of seeing shadow people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have, you know, it happens, you know, we were sleeping in the hospital there at night and there was, you know, we were in the patient rooms upstairs, nice, comfortable beds that were just sat up and everything. And but people saw stuff, you know, and they say I'm, nurses gonna, are the gonna, most haunted people. I'm going to have to cut you off there because we do have to go to our first break of the night. Ian Holt is our guest, producer of the movie Unhinged, writer of Drac- Dracula's sequel. And we're going to be joined by his buddy, Mike Kusiak, right after this break. You're listening to Space Out Radio. We'll be right back. From coast to coast to coast, Blacklight Uncharted is taking on the paranormal across Canada. From ghostly hauntings to the UFOs flying above in conjunction with MUFON Canada, we're closely investigating what's going on in the northern skies and checking out the apparitions that walk among us. Check out our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. We want to know your thoughts, we want to hear your experiences, and we want you to share your stories. The answers are out there, and we intend to find them. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members-only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. The third Monday of every month, Spaced Out Radio is going to bring you a different look at everything paranormal. Welcome to The Reporters. Jim Mallard, Vanessa Hogel, Denise Garcia, and Christina George join me, Dave Scott, for a look at the weird and strange from the other side of the microphone. We'll break down ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, and the people investigating them. The paranormal media has never been heard like this. Come listen to The Reporters. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter Online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter The Encounter. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? Have you had an experience you can't explain? Had a run-in with ghosts, maybe Bigfoot, or seen lights in the sky? Hi, I'm Mike Schmidt from the SOR Sight Lines. I'm here to investigate your sighting. Head to spacedoutradio.com and fill out a report on the sight lines. All your information is 100% confidential, and I will help you figure out what you've been seeing. File your report, and let's find out the answers together. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. 
With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Have you got your Cosmic Passport? If you need one, tune in to Cosmic Passport on Spaced Out Weekend. This is Elizabeth Anglin, ET experiencer, spirit medium, and host of Cosmic Passport. Each weekend, I'll be bringing you interviews and support from other paranormal experiencers and the best in intuitive spiritual guidance from across the globe. It's all happening starting at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, midnight Eastern, on spacedoutradio.com. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com, where I... Vincent Zunza and my super sleuth partner Alexandra Sullivan track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest, from Bigfoot to Mel's Hole and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, there's only one way to rock loud and proud. In high definition, Radio 702 Rocks, Las Vegas. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. Spacedoutradio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Now, back to Dave Scott and S.O.R. Welcome back to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you along for the ride. Tomorrow night on the program, we have Jeanette Latulipe. We are going to be talking the combination of Bigfoot and UFOs. Are the two intertwined? Let's find out at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time, tomorrow night at SpacedOutRadio.com. We want to introduce you to our terrestrial radio stations thank you so much if you're listening in on wqee 99 rock the key down in noon in georgia the home of the walking dead and we are also live in new orleans on 107.7 fm the united public radio network joe montaldo's network and 160 countries around the world that one spreads thank you so much for bringing us into your home your car your business wherever you are listening we're also live on renegade talk radio out of las vegas and on revolution radio remember the double r machine is a donation station financed by you the valued listeners Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Ultimo Genitor. 
Ultimate Genitor is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, space travelers, as Bill sets the password each and every night right here on the Mighty SOR. If you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Also, if you want to communicate with me on Twitter during the show, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I'll get to you there as well. Thank you so much, Rhonda, John, Eric, and Moog Boy, all of you. Thank you so much for being with us. Bumblefoot has even shared this show tonight, our music master. So we got to thank him for that as well. Also, what you can do is follow us on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Give our page a like. I'm on Instagram, Dave Scott, S O R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download this show and others on iTunes. Are also. We can also, pardon me, are on RadioGuide.fm, TalkStream Live, and on Stitcher. Our website is SpacedOutRadio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including the SOR Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month. And you can read the Encounter online, our brand new news section. And if you head on over to Patreon.com for $1 a month, you can become a patron of Spaced Out Radio, so check that out as well. Ian Holt is our guest. He's the author of the sequel of Dracula, as well as the producer of the movie Unhinged. We've now been joined by his movie friend, Mike Kusiak, as well. Gentlemen, welcome back. Hey, man. Hey, everyone. I'm so excited to have Cooch on the show, because Cooch and I go back to the 90s, and Cooch is the man who almost, uh, picked almost. up I would say oh two, bro. Okay. okay, all right, somewhere around like late nineties. It was the late nineties. Yeah. I don't even remember, but it was. Kuchu <laughs> discovered my uh, Dracula of the Undead and uh, brought it when he was working for the management company that I was with. Brought it out and uh, made the deal, and he's responsible for me being here. So we went on to form a partnership with Alt House Productions, and now we're doing unhinged with our other partner michael alden the great michael alden and uh we are now doing unhinged and mike is the writer director and also producer through old house of death metal so we'll be shooting that this summer so um it's a long and fruitful relationship mike is the man on everything horror excellent excellent it's been a long and yeah it's been a long and winding road yes (laughs) <laughs> well, a, 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 a good Ukrainian name like Kuchiak, you know, that, that Polish. that's... Polish. Oh, Polish. you're Polish. Yeah, the Polish. See, even though I use a pseudonym, I use my middle name as my last mm-hmm. name. My last name, long in Ukrainian. So we're in the same territory there, man. Same no, territory. I, you, man. I, 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 I mean, uh, the spelling and pronunciation have very little to do with each other, and that's always a sign that's a Polish last name. <laughs> Absolutely. How did you get into the movie? How did you get into the movie industry, Mike? Uh, long story short, uh, I am completely useless in any other situation. Uh, I, I, I've, I've no ability to work a square job. Is what it is. Uh, I, I, you know, the film industry is as close as I can get to like an adult uh, job, if that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. That's why I nighttime radio it. You know what I'm saying? I gotta yeah, do something. I, I'm doing I something. I can't do suit and tie. I can't do offices. Uh, this is as close as I can get to like r- responsible adult work. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do. Um, I, uh, uh, the film industry I, I was actually my backup for a very long time. I was trying very hard to be rock star. Uh, I was uh, playing bass in punk rock bands in Chicago uh, in the 90s, and I, I, during that kind of upswell when everybody was gang signed, everybody except for my bands. <laughs> uh, and I thought um, I should have a backup just on the off slight chance that I didn't become a rock star, and uh, my backup was film school. And kind of in the same way that like a lot of people will well, have a square job, to you know, just make sure that the rent gets paid no matter what. I, in my case, it was movies, and uh, you know, punk rock didn't work out, so I came out to LA, and it was movies for me, man. But uh, I, I, yeah, if, if if anything, you'd be 
you know, that much extra drive to make sure that something happened, if that makes sense. Because a lot of people come out to LA and they, you know, they kind of give film a whirl and then they go back to Minnesota or whatever. But in my case, it was, I was completely about let's make this shit happen. You know? So again, I, I, I that has hurt me endlessly. Yeah. As Ian can attest, because yeah, I mean, dude, if, if I latch my shit onto something, then it's going to happen then, you know? Well, that was it. You know, it was, it, it, that, that was the same thing with me. It was, it was make it in film or die. <laughs> Cause I couldn't mm-hmm. hold mm-hmm. on to a job. I couldn't hold on to a nine to five job. I mean, when I started mm-hmm. out acting, I mean, you know, I, how many jobs I quit just for, because I said I couldn't get time off to go to audition. So I said, I quit, <laughs> you know, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then, you know, that, and it's just, it's just, it was just my nature. I was either going to do this or I wasn't going to do anything. You have to get into a little rowboat and start going out to the ocean. And that's how you make it yes. happen, man. Yeah. My, my, my teacher at NYU, Stella Adler, who trained uh, Brando and De Niro, said, mm-hmm. first day of class, half of you are not going to be in the industry the other half are going to try it and and not get anywhere and just fade away. The rest, the other rest of you, half of you will get lucky and become stars, and the rest of you are going to make it by attrition. <laughs> and that's yeah, that was true. I, you know, here's the thing though: is there there's an illusion that um, you know, quote unquote, square jobs uh, offered that much more stability, but that's you know, the secret, you know, little lie is that's not true. I knew a friend of mine whose father went to call it. Uh, he was a dentist. And he said that when dentists go to school, I mean, they're told that the, uh, the suicide rate of dentists is very high. So they will tell you in class that several of you will be dead within a, a decade by your own hand. And so I would <laughs> you know, Trying to make something happen in film, literature, books, TV, something, uh, <laughs> rather than be, be a dead dentist, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, it's <laughs> funny because most of my fraternity brothers that were in pre-med at NYU wound up, half of them wound up being dentists because they couldn't hang in pre-med. And my, my dad, you know, mm-hmm. he w- was going to be a dentist, couldn't take it, couldn't take it, wound up in the Merchant Marine, landed in... Havana before uh, Castro met a bunch of his buddies who were like mobsters from from uh, the, the Bronx where he was from, and they sure. put, they yeah. opened, and he wound up managing Club Americana there and had to escape on the night Castro came down from the mountain. So he wound wow. up as a host at the, at the Catskills Resort. So the story I mean, of my mom and dad meeting is Dirty Dancing. So that really happened. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But, I, I mean. It's, that's the way things go. Him, man. You, like, you know, he thought he would kill himself if he stayed being a dentist. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I mean, that's kind of thing. It was like I, I, when I started going to film school, uh, I was playing in bands. When I moved out to L.A., like a lot of people in Chicago, where I'm from, uh, I mean, they acted like I was running off to join the circus. But I mean, you know, I'll tell you why, man. You were. I mean, it's, I, 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 I mean, that's true. I mean, don't get me wrong. But it's like, uh, you know, apparently there's a higher mortality rate of staying in Chicago and becoming a dentist than running us to join the circus. So I, I made out okay. <laughs> and you're lucky you didn't join the circus because now the circus is closed. Ooh. Marvin Bailey's done. <laughs> I heard about work. that. I heard about yeah. that. Uh, I, I, I was pleased to have seen it at least once. Uh, but I, I mean, at the end of the day, um, in our current situation, it becomes basically a traveling Vegas show. If you want to have right. a Barnaby Valley Circus type thing, you, you have that as a show in Vegas, and people spend like $150 to go see that. Yeah, and you don't travel around for it because, I mean, it's just not the, that world anymore. You know, you, you don't have to bring entertainment to the small town. The, the small town can plug into the internet and see it whenever they want, you know? So, yeah. And, you, and you the whole animal cruelty thing, you know, and, and, and how everyone looks at how the animals are kept now and trained. Sure. 
sir. Oh, and, and now, yeah, 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 yeah. like the woman who played the ghost in episode 50 was mm. uh, double jointed and an acrobat from right, Cirque yeah. du Soleil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Mike, I'm not do- double yeah. jointed or an acrobat. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Mike, I want to bring you in here because you you deal a lot in the in the horror movie realm. Why do you think? I do. Why do you think people love the blood, gore, and the suspense that goes along with that? Because let's face it, for a lot of society, that's really not the norm. Yet we all love a good horror movie film for some reason. Sure, absolutely. I think that a horror movie is the cinematic version of a roller coaster ride in the sense that we get a little taste of death, you know, threat of death, enough of it to be fun. We get a one on the 10 scale, if that makes sense. Uh, so whereas a, a roller coaster will, you know, uh, will affect gravity, it'll make you scream, it'll do that entire thing. It's a very similar situation. Uh, it's the roller coaster ride version of a cinematic film, but at the same time, I I think that cinema at core is a shareable dream, and a horror movie is the nightmare version thereof. If that makes sense. So, I mean, some people have pleasant dreams and those are your normal movies i guess you could say and uh when it comes to a horror movie it's the nightmare version um but it's it's a little taste of death it's a, it, 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 it it's a little bit of poison on the tip of your tongue that allows you to you know, to to get that experience it's a uh, uh it's a skydive it's a roller coaster ride. An endorphin it's high. A, An endorphin high. Yeah, exactly. And um, I read a book a long time ago when I was in film school that compared the uh, cinematic experience of, of comedy and horror. Uh, and they're both very much the, um, the, the crowd reaction. Um, you want to laugh at the same time as this room full of people who are all sitting in, in a dark room at the same time. You want to scream at the same time at this room full. Yeah. Uh, and there's a room full of people in the dark room. You know, it's, um, you're, you're sharing uh, a, a frightening experience and then you get to look at each other and, and laugh nervously. And there, there's something very human about that. And I, I think it's deeply um, valuable in its own way. Do you think you for know, some people, people it's an addiction? That, oh yeah, I mean you know people that jump off the side of mountains and go out of out of planes with parachutes, they all say they feel the most alive when they're closest to death, and I think that plays into horror movies too. I mean, in our for most of us, thankfully, in our everyday lives, we don't face that kind of mortality, so we, you know something in our DNA from back when we ran in the trees, you know, we, we seek that out. So when we get that rush, you know, that life and death moment of rush, you know, it's like fight club when, why, why people love that movie. It's, it's feeling like you're this that connecting with that animal instinct that is still part of us that creates that flight or fight reaction that, feels the endorphins you know it, it it's there's an excitement to it and like you said is a shared experience you know when you're in it there's one thing seeing a horror movie at home and so many horror movies today are straight to video and we lose that um communal experience like i remember going opening night to you know friday the 13th uh, part four the final chapter and the theater was packed and the, the the screaming and all of that was so invigorating when people started screaming together and laughing together and yelling at the screen. And it became such a, uh, communal excitement that I, uh, you know, it, it, I'll never forget it. I mean, that's just like one movie experience out of millions that I've had. And that one stands out more than all the rest. 
I and that is an excellent film. <laughs> it's, I, it's a lot of fun to watch. I have to admit, I had a little bit of an addiction to Freddy Krueger and A Nightmare on Elm Street growing up. But where crap got real for me during that, guys, is I used to sleep as a teenager with my radio on. And when okay. Will when Will Smith was still act was still you know the French Fresh Prince and still doing his rapping yeah. thing, okay, he did a song about called N- N- uh, Night No Nightmare on My Street or something along those lines. Right, right, right. A Nightmare right, yeah. on My I remember Street. Remember that? Yeah. That there's, song. There's, that, there's actually a video. There's yes. a video of that yet that they can dig up. On, Absolutely. On I've and you, seen it. It's it, it's 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 a lot of fun. It's good. Mm-hmm. It's fun. And the radio station I listened to was out of Bellingham, Washington, called uh, KISM ninety two point nine, okay. and they played this right. song over and over again, along with Dream Warriors by Dawkins. And great song. Uh, between two <laughs> between two yeah. o'clock in the morning and three thirty every night for about a week, mm-hmm. I was woken up. Every night between two and three thirty in the morning, to this song playing, and it scared the living crap out of me. So much so, I actually started sleeping with my radio off, you know, for the first time because I was so scared about it coming on. It freaked the living daylights out of me, man. Freaked the living Why daylights. I, 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 I mean. I, I, I mean, part three is like way more of an action movie than a horror movie. I, I mean, why was it hitting you that hard, though? I, I, it wasn't the movie that was hitting me. It was just the huh? idea that the song kept on popping up between two and three thirty every morning, almost like it was haunting me itself. And that brought a uh, hell of a that brought a hell of a reality to it. Right, well, that's uh, inter- that's interesting that you say that because. I mean, the story behind the movie is, you know, Wes Craven was a professor who studied uh, religion. And part of this study was him investigating the dream demons. Mm -hmm. And his investigation into dream demons, he believes manifested in a dream demon haunting him. At, At a specific time of night, every night, dream demon would come to him. And according to the philosophy of, or the mythology, if you die in your dream, you die in real life. So he was terrified. So when you see New Nightmare, that's actually true. That's the real story behind the conception of Nightmare on Elm Street. So, you know, while he was doing Last House on the Left and all of this, he always had this in the back of his mind. It just didn't put it together to Freddy Krueger. But it, he had, you know, fright bears and all that stuff, night terrors right. and all of that, which he believed you know, came to him in the Dream Demon. Now, the song playing every night is very reminiscent of that. Maybe you contacted a Dream Demon by uh, by seeing the movie. <laughs> quite possibly. Very much quite possibly. All I know is that scared the living daylights out of me. And, and it, huh. I didn't watch A Nightmare on Elm Street for a couple of years because I was afraid to be terrorized by that song at night again. You know, <laughs> right, right. And this is what yeah, goes I, through I, a seventeen-year-old's mind, right? Sure. Yeah. I, 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 the, the, the first one is, a, is an honestly frightening, terrifying film. It's one of the yeah. classics for a reason. I mean, it's a very, very good movie. I, I mean, if the idea that uh, you're, you're trying to deliver the goods on your genre, you know, a good comedy is a movie that makes you laugh a lot. And a good horror movie is one that is very scary for the audience. And uh, the night, you know, the original Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, still to this day, absolutely delivers. And I mean, because it's coming from a very core, primal, human experience element, it's very good. The funny thing, when I went to see it on opening night, oh. you know, I had been scared in a movie since I saw in theaters, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, you know, I went to the Exorcist right. at four years old and I laughed all the way through it. But Nightmare and Elm Street scared <laughs> me. I actually found my... I was sitting next to these two giant black-eyed bodybuilders. Their arms were as mm-hmm. big as my waist. And I feel myself... I ha, It was cold in the theater. I had the jacket on my lap. And I felt myself pulling the jacket up like I, like I was a little kid. 
And I, I was laughing at myself at a moment, like I'm getting scared. And I look over and these two giant bodybuilders are hiding under their jackets too. And it was the funniest thing. We looked at each other. We started <laughs> laughing, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 What? I remember uh, uh, right before I moved to L.A., uh, The Exorcist was really re-released. There was a uh, you know special edition that had um, you know some CGI type stuff, and you know Regan and the Spider Walk, and you know X Y Z, and um, there were like three or four dudes that were sitting behind me, and they were just kind of be the smart asses about the movie. I, I mean, this is a film that I, I, I regard. Uh, you know, so highly that and almost to a holy level, uh, it's one of the best movies ever made. To, to, I mean, in my opinion, and these guys are just kind of like smart asking about throughout the film, and I didn't want to say anything about, it, but you know, it's kind of kept my mouth shut right up until Regan comes down the stairs, and uh, she's in a spider walk, and she screams, and blood comes out of her mouth. And we cut away from that, and uh, these these four dudes just drop dead silent, and, they, and one of them finally goes, "Damn!" <laughs> <laughs> the, the film finally found them, if that makes sense, you know. Yeah, well, that's what happens, you know. The, the these moments stay with you. I mean, you know, yeah. For some people, it's Scarlet. I don't give a damn. You know, for others, it's you know the spider walk, or or you know, right. uh, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. the first appearance of Leatherface grabbing the girl and pulling her into the door and slamming it shut with that slam. You know, yeah. you yeah. never forget that. I, 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 I mean, the, at the court, under his eye. <laughs> yeah, precisely. I, 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 at court, I, I mean, cinema is a shared dream, but I, I mean, at, uh, but narrative is a distillation of human experience. And if you can, you know, I, 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 so when you see a narrative horror film, you're getting a distillation of, of nightmare. You're, you're getting like a, a very powerful dose of that poison. And, um, but at the same time, it, it's, it's safe. You're sitting in a room full of people who you don't know, but you know for a fact that you're safe. You know, uh, uh, you're just watching a flick on image on a screen and for that flickering image to elicit a flight response is one of the most powerful things that cinema can do because it's it's telling it, 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 it's triggering within the audience the ability to to get frightened of something that they know for a fact is not dangerous and that is coming from the core I, I, you know, a moment ago, I mean, you were talking about like, you know, where we're living in the trees. You know, it's like, I, I am, you know, horror cinema is, is playing on when we were, you know, living in a very core element of our existence. And I think that's why it's so powerful. Do you believe then that a lot of people can create their own paranormal experiences? through what they believe in horror movies. Ian, let's start with you on that. that that's hmm. interesting you say that, because 99% of ghost sightings are not dangerous. We color our ghost sightings by what we see in the movies. So the fear that we have about seeing a ghost is because of what we've seen in the horror movies. The actual experience of a ghost is usually not that terrifying. You know, for me, when I was a kid and I saw things, I was terrified because I was a kid and I didn't understand it. But as you get older and you experience these things, I, like, I know the magic, you know, behind the horror movie, so I'm not scared by it. So I have a very different reaction to seeing an entity so it's you know a lot of hollywood's horror movies color our fears of ghosts whereas in other cultures like you know even going back to the pics or the celts ghosts were a positive thing you go to mexico there's 
it's a positive it's a positive thing to see a ghost you're seeing your ancestors or you know you're seeing proof of life after death and that you'll see your ancestors again so it, or or in haiti in the voodoo culture or in new orleans or in africa certain you know worshiping of the ancestors and all of that or even native american cultures it's a positive thing to see a ghost so i think our fear of this is created by the horror films we see What's your are opinion you of that, Mike? The idea that, uh, are you touching on the idea that perhaps people who, if we have one million people who watch a horror movie, eventually the combined psychic energy of those one million people will create the horror movie in reality? Um, I don't think that that will occur. Uh, but I will say that uh, I, 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 you know, let me step back and say this. Uh, when my mother died, uh, she began to ring the doorbell of her house for about a, uh, for, for several weeks. And um, I, I, I've been, I would say, um, almost inculcated against uh, you know, being frightened by ghostly stuff due to the fact that I'm a horror nerd guy. You, you you would think that because I'm a horror dude that any actual haunting type things would roll off of me. But in in reality, mm-hmm. when I was actually presented with a ghostly presence, I was, it scared the hell out of me. You know, uh, because for the, you know for for the majority of us, I mean, it, it, it it's for fun. You know, I mean, it was exactly like being a guy who works a roller coaster ride all day, suddenly so being put into a situation of uh, skydiving into Normandy, if that makes sense. Uh, the, the, the fantasy had become reality, and it was terrifying. Uh, and I, I'm sure that Ian kind of touched on it. It was prim- you know, the fear was primarily coming from inexperience, but at the same time, it was still scary. Uh, it is frightening for the living to encounter the the dead in any way, shape, or form. Um, and I think that you know horror movies get, get, give us a little taste of that. They give us a, 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 a simulacrum, a VR version of that encounter. But when you run into it in real life, it's it's still a tough time, you know. Well, it, it, it's, that's very true, especially when you first encounter them. When you see the shadow person or you have a doorbell ringing or you have a door slamming on its own. You know, I, I remember as a kid, we had a doorbell ringing in our house. And we, we lived on a, in an apartment building, so there was a hallway in the stairway door. First, if you, call, if you ring the elevator, if we thought it was a ring and run, so one of my friends playing a prank, mm-hmm. but, you know, the door we we would like stand at the door after it rings and then would and we'd look out the viewfinder there'd be no one there and then it would ring again and we'd swing open the door and no one would be there and there was no way they could run to the stair door in that amount of time it took me to open the door so that yeah. that scared me you know the fact that yeah. you know there's nobody there but yeah. later in life I, 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 as I, I, I've had interactions mm-hmm. once it came to interaction with an intelligent haunt, the fear went away because most of the intelligent haunts you meet uh, confront you is a, is a someone looking to communicate. They're trying to communicate with you. They're in a place where they can't get to you. So they're desperate and you feel that desperation and it becomes almost, I can't even explain it. It's like you want to help them. They're, They're not frightening to you. They're, they're desperate in a lot of ways mm. to get out a message, to find someone they lost sure. to finish sure. something in yeah. life, you know, and that becomes a whole, that the, the fright goes away and you, it's almost like, you know, you've show, you're an EMT showing up at a crash scene and wanting to help the victim. It's that kind of right. altruistic feeling that you get when you actually interact with them. And that changes everything. Yeah. I, I, I never was able to develop that level of callous of experience to, to, to react in that manner. Uh, you know, when my, my father passed away, 
my mom frequently you know told me and she was like yeah you're, you know, your your dad is giving you a hard time i'm like what do you mean she's like uh you know electronics within the house would turn on and off uh the microwave would beep uh the tv would go on and off by itself that's that, 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 that and she said that it went on constantly and i only witnessed it like one or two times and due to the fact that i only saw it one or two times I was still like kind of, eh, yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, you know, come on, you know, whatever. But in a very serious way, uh, when my mother passed away, and uh, myself and my daughter were uh, we were getting her her house together, um, you know, we're just kind of going through it and cleaning it, and you know, X Y Z. You know, the door would ring in the middle of the day, and we would open the door. There's no one there. X Y Z. And this would constantly happen, uh, whether we were by ourselves or whether there were visitors there. Uh, I would tell people about it, and they would laugh at me, and then people would come over, and the door would ring, and we would open it up and go, see, that's what I'm talking about. And it was interesting that I had to go back to L.A. to care of business for a little bit, and when I returned, I was sleeping in that house, and at 1 in the morning, uh, instead of just a single ding dong, as it happened before, it was ding a 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 frantic, constant thing. And I ran out, threw open the door. There's no one there. The entire thing. This would happen night after night after night. And I will tell you guys, I don't believe in anything, anything, but what my five senses told me. And, you know, after a week of that, it was like living in a poisonous mine, if that makes sense. Um, there was a pervasive negative element to it. I couldn't get enough sleep because uh, I was dreading that, that doorbell. And finally, when I sold that house, um, you know, when you sell a house, you hire somebody to do a top to bottom inspection of the property. And in this case, uh, you know, I kind of half joked when we said, well, you know, you're probably going to find a you know, problem with the doorbell. And, you know, it's a thing with the doorbell going on. And the electrician who did that entire thing was like, no, there's no problem with the doorbell. It is perfectly fine. So wow. at the end of the day, uh, I've spoken to people about this and they said, you know, it's your mother. She was trying to communicate with you. She's trying to tell you something. And at the end of the day, I have no idea what you're trying to tell somebody by laying on the doorbell at one in the morning again and again and again. And until that happened, I was the ultimate skeptic. But until you get haunted in real life, that's when you go, there might be something. So that's my little story. I want to get to a question well, from you know. De- uh, in one second. We're going to get to a question here from Dennis in our chat room in Spreaker. And Dennis is asking, so why didn't horror movies in your mind, like Terror Train and Hell Knight, work then? Um, well, it could be the script. It could be the year that they came out because... In the 80s, there was a glut of horror films every week, and they started repeating themselves. So, um, you know, the the fans kind of got bored with it. Um, it could also be that, you know, I find the more fantastical stuff. We talked about this last, last time I was on. There's a formula for the stuff. And if you stick to the form, you could be original. Like, like I said, Nightmare on Elm Street is very original. The whole dream thing, not falling asleep, is all very original. But it's still about a guy with knives killing teenagers. So there's a formula to this stuff. And if you go too far outside the formula, you you risk losing the audience. Because it, horror movies for a lot of people are comfort food. You know, it's like it's like going out and getting a Twix bar or, a, or an ice cream. You know what you're going to get walking in, and that's what you want. You know, a lot of times trailers don't show the movie you know like greatest example blade runner 
Blade Runner looked like an action movie with Harrison Ford, Han Solo in the future, right? Fighting robots, right? Replicants. I went to see it. It was a deep, intense sci-fi movie. I hated it the first time I see it, saw it because I was in the mood for an action movie. Once I knew it was in an action movie and I watched it again on home video, I loved it. It's about, you know, the right marketing campaign and all those things. It could be a n- numerous things why horror movies don't work. Sometimes the director's just that good. He's that good at direct putting scares in. Mike, what do you what do you think? Why do some horror movies not work? I think that uh, at the end of the day, a horror movie has to embody a true human fear. Uh, to paraphrase H.G. Lovecraft, um, you uh, the the idea is that you you know the oldest and deepest fear, the emotion of humanity is fear, and um, if you can trigger that in some way, uh, and you have to lead into it with reality, uh, and I would say that for instance, uh, The Exorcist is a very effective horror movie because it's playing on the fear of a parent who has a sick child. You don't know how to cure her. You, you don't want to know what to do. And, um, you know, the core scene of the exorcist isn't uh, the exorcism scenes. It's the spinal tap scenes where they're running weak into these tests and, uh, and they're trying to figure out what's going on with her. And it's this torture that this poor little girl is going through. And at the end of the situation, the doctors have no solution. And they go, well, maybe we can do it again. And uh, Ellen Burstyn is horrified by the idea. And, you know, very similarly, you look at The Shining, another extremely famous horror film, uh, terribly frightening. And this is a movie that is about uh, an abusive parent. And in this case, it's daddy is a drunk. And uh, we love him, but he is uh, an ephemeral element. He can go either way. He can be negative or positive. And, uh, you know, that is a very core human fear uh, and, and the more that we can have those fears bubble up from childhood, uh, the more effective they are. I mean, if we're now, talking see, about like a sick, sick kid, daddy is I have drunk totally and dangerous. Okay. See, I have a totally different. I think you're right, but I see it also as exorcist. It's the fear of Catholic dogma. You know, you better be, you better be good because the devil exists. Everything sure. we're telling you, you better listen to. And that Catholic guilt, you know, and the confessional and all that Catholic dogma, it, it, if you're, if you believe in that stuff or are interested in it or, or Catholic, it plays mm-hmm. on you, you know, and it plays on those fears of, the, of, of evil existing and evil can enter even an innocent child. Evil is everywhere, and you must always be ready to fight it and fight the temptation oh, of it. Sure. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah, for The yeah. Shining, The Shining for me is the ultimate embodiment of the fear of being trapped. Jack Nicholson uh, in that movie sure, yeah. is a man who fell in love with a, who had sex with a woman he didn't love, and she got pregnant, and he wound up married. And it ruined his right. What his dream was to be a writer, and a, a real man puts that aside to take his family. He was he right, right. Hated her for that, and she was trapped in trying to appease a man that she didn't really mm-hmm. know or love for the sake of her kid. And both of those things manifest in the hate that grows internally, subconsciously. The 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 you know about being trapped in a family, you know, and that responsibility, right. you know, sure, that to I, me is I, something I, everyone I, I, understands. Yeah. I, I mean, given the fact that, and even before they go to the overlook hotel, they're, they're still 
very much trapped in that shitty apartment in Colorado, you know, uh, right. with, with all the books on the shelf and, and sort of thing. I think that I mean, it, it is a film about, you know, the terror of, uh, you know, the darkness that is within, that is within you. I, I mean, Jack doesn't right. really want to be a, a bad guy, you know, but he wants he to be a man child. He, he doesn't want to grow yeah. up. He wants to but, pursue his dream. All work and no play yeah. makes Jack a dull boy. You know, exactly. it's exactly but, what's what he writes a million times. And the, yeah, very true. Very true. Very true. And the ghosts uh, are trying but, to get him to, to freedom. Kill your family. Yeah. Be free. Be with us. Live in this party, this constant party that's going on behind yeah. the scenes at this hotel. Yeah. Live with us. You know, but at the same time, I, I, and there's still a decency that runs through him. You know, the idea that you know, when Wendy accuses him of strangling uh, uh, his son, he's horrified by the idea. And uh, you know, when he really you know flips out in a nightmare situation, it's when uh, you know he's presented with a, a nightmare of him uh, hurting his wife and child. Uh, that's when he's like, no, no, no. He doesn't want to be that guy. He does does I'm not. I'm not going to hurt you, Wendy. Guy. I'm just going to bash your brains in. You know? Not until later. I mean, not until later. Yeah, that not until later. No, but that's I, I, you know. I, I mean, I, isn't I, that I, isn't that a relationship? At times, we love our significant other, and at times, we want to kill them. There's a very thin line between love and hate, and that that moral code or the. The, of religion and all this stuff and the, and the rule of law that prevents us from going there. If right. that's taken away and we have a space in an eternity of partying in a hotel with a bunch of cool ghosts, you know, True. Yeah. yeah, that you have no more fears about any of that. And now I get to kill my wife and kid who's been dragging me down all these years, preventing me from but, my dream. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. the, the idea that, uh, I, I, I I think that this is the hotel playing on uh, you know it, you know it's kind of a, a a devil's whisper. It's playing on his weaknesses. Uh, you know the idea right. Even that, the butler, uh, right? The guy in the bathroom. I did what yeah, I did to yeah, my family. Absolutely. Yeah. And now look at us. We're all hanging out, partying all the time. I'm free. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. a great party. Yeah. You know. You know, with, with and everything. You know, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Lloyd, the, the very friendly bartender, he's like, uh, "Your friend is good with us, sir." You know, uh, you know, uh, he is allowed his weaknesses. He doesn't have to assume his r responsibilities so long as he lets go of his own morality, um, and ultimately to uh, or you know, indulges, and, and you know, indulges his animal, the animal instinct. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, I, know, I, I, bears, you know, bears, like, bears kill their <laughs> male bears kill their cubs. So that they can leave, you know, they eat sure. their cubs. So, yeah, so I, I, I mean, the idea too. being that uh, you get to be this um, this dream self that you have created, uh, so long as you're willing to uh, to sacrifice uh, whatever we tell you, and uh, it's like, oh, 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 you get to be this cool guy in this eternal party, so long as you murder your wife and child. And, uh, yeah, and that, that kind of is the whisper of evil, right. you know? Right. <laughs> I, I'm going to hop in here with and, a question. You, Ian, I'm going to okay. hop in here sure. with a question. Sorry. Dennis is asking, do, you, do either of you think remakes of horror films are a good idea? He brings up Suspiria. I think of what Rob Zombie <laughs> is trying to do all the time and, and technify these remakes of horror movies. What do you guys think? Ian, Ian, you start. Uh, I have my own set of thoughts. Ian, you start. Uh, I go. think remakes, in general, are the worst idea of of any idea <laughs> because because in general okay. they never latch on to what made the first one great. There are a few great remakes, you know, I, I, and I'll, I'll go to a director who did two of them. Uh, Alexander Aja, who did um, the remake of Maniac and the remake of the the, uh, the Hills Have Eyes, the Hills uh, Have uh, Eyes. That was remake, actually, uh, for, for Frank Calhoun did uh, Maniac. Maniac, but Alexander Aja produced it, if I yeah, remember yes, correctly. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they he was involved in both of them. So mm -hmm. um, in the Hills Have Eyes, we get a modern take 
a, a retelling of The Hills Have Eyes, and it's about a father protecting a baby, saving his baby. That root of the movie is what makes us root for the hero and hate the villains and puts us in a terrifying situation because we all understand we want to protect our own, our family, our child. So that is the flip side of The Shining. You know, this is a father who loves his family and is glad to have his family and he's going to protect the child. And, and where they said it in a modern setting and it's, it's completely different than the original, and it has uh, its own theme and its own purpose, and I loved it. Now, you go to Maniac. The story of Maniac, what made Maniac so different from every other horror film of the period was the, the villain was the lead, but it was played by a man who was fat, crater-faced and that's why he wrote the movie he wrote it originally as a love story and he couldn't sell it because everyone told him no one would buy this movie because no one would believe a guy that looks like you joe spinell is going to be in love with carolyn monroe so he turned it into a horror movie despite them and what that horror movie is about is the image of what we portray as beauty in order for a man to be successful, he can't be a janitor. He can't not have a car. He can't be all these things. He can't be fat, and he can't be crater-faced. He has to look a certain way. He has to have all these certain things and the right kind of job to get the right kind of woman. And, and what we do to our kids, what we do to our kids plays into what, how they treat other people. And it's all about the, the, the media imagery of what a perfect man looks like, what a perfect job is, and that plays into what a beautiful woman is that he can't have, and that anger that the, me the movies tell you, the nerd kid is going to get the girl at the end. There's always a happy ending in the movies or on TV. In real life, it doesn't work like that. And that is his rage. And that is really important to the story. And if you have the, Frodo, the mannequins, the, the mannequins are very symbolic. Right. And if you have Frodo, who's a he may be short, but he's a good looking guy who can get women. The whole movie doesn't work. And they lost what the spine of the story is about. And therefore, it doesn't work. So just getting a star and throwing it in and remaking the movie, even though Maniac is a well-made remake, it loses the whole purpose of the movie, and that's where remake fails. If a remake could stand on its own and, and come at something in a new and different way, I'm all for it. But most of the time, it's just a repeat, a retelling, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake, well-made remake. But it's the exact movie. Why do I need to see that? I could see the original and, and, yeah, and get yeah, the same yeah, joke yeah. out of it. I'm, I'm going to cut you guys yeah, off there because we have about uh, three and a half minutes before we got to go to break. Mm. You, you guys were just talking about The Shining here moments ago, and Bob in the SOR Space Travelers brought up a real interesting comment here. He says, in the movie of The Shining, it is supposedly to have secret messages in regarding the moon landing possibly being a hoax. Have either one of you ever heard that rumor? <laughs> I, well, I, 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 I've I, heard about I it. I saw a room... I, 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 I personally saw a room 237, the documentary. Right, yeah, great. great documentary. And... It's, a, it's an excellent documentary, but what I took from that documentary was that every person who walks into a movie brings themselves into that film. If that makes sense. Everybody who uh, uh, had a different take on Room 237 was like, uh, I study Indian artifacts, thereby I see this film through that lens. And I... Uh, I, I think that you know you bring into that film what you want to bring into it, and uh, you know the, the strength of Kubrick is uh, he leaves yes. his films open to that interpretation, and um, as do the Coens. But I mean, I personally well, don't Kubrick think that lovers always about say that. that he frames his shots to tell more of the story. Like you know, he's got to mm -hmm. get the frame 
of the shot and, and all the set dressing and everything perfect to tell more of the story. So mm -hmm. because it's unsaid, what you bring into the movie, just like Hoot says, is what you see. So, you know, how you interpret his visuals is always open to interpretation because he never said it. He never, you know, now he never will. But, you know, it, it, that's the beauty of Kubrick. You can watch his movies mm -hmm. over and over again and see so many different things in it. Um, yeah, and the, it's all open the, you know, to the conjecture. Lure, yeah, the, the, yeah, the lure of Kubrick films is the fact that he was known to be an, an exacting filmmaker. So uh, anything that you see within his frame, you can immediately presuppose is valuable, is necessary and important. So if Danny is wearing a, a little sweater with a rocket on it, you can really go, oh, this is a signal that he... Uh, faked the moon landing due to the fact that he's a very exacting filmmaker and we, uh, he has this uh, kid within the frame wearing this thing and ultimately I don't know. Yeah. Alright all right, guys, I gotta cut you off right there because we are going to go to our final break of the night here on Spaced Out Radio. Ian Holt you know him if you've listened to this show before, one of our most popular guests on the program, as well as Mike Kuciak, who is a film director as well. We're talking Hollywood, we're talking music, we're talking horror films, the suspense, what builds people around it. That's what we are doing tonight for another hour right after this. And we want to say hello to everyone participating in our chat rooms tonight, along with on WQEE 99, Rock the Key in Newton, Georgia, and on our other terrestrial station, United Public Radio Networks, live on 107.7 FM in New Orleans. Hey, while you're listening to the break, head on over to Patreon.com. Patreon is... You can become a patron of ours for as low as $1 a month. I would love it if you check it out. So please head on over there and help us grow. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I will be right back right after this. The SOR Sightlines is a place for you to find answers to your strange experiences. Hi there, this is Mike Schmidt. If you have had an encounter with ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, ETs, or anything else that doesn't make sense... Head to spacedoutradio.com and file a Sightlines report. All information you give is 100% confidential, and I will personally help you find the answers you need. SOR Sightlines. Your answers are a click away. Have you got your Cosmic Passport? If you need one, tune in to Cosmic Passport on Spaced Out Weekend. This is Elizabeth Anglin, ET experiencer, spirit medium, and host of Cosmic Passport. Each weekend, I'll be bringing you interviews and support from other paranormal experiencers and the best in intuitive spiritual guidance from across the globe. It's all happening starting at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, midnight Eastern, on spacedoutradio.com. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with Euphorcop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Wachowski's Strange Days. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit, and expect a miracle. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. 
questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. This is Eric Markham, news editor for Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top quality paranormal stories. From alien encounters to the latest conspiracies, you won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top-notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter, online, only at spacedoutradio.com. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio, or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio. And on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Now, back to the program.
Welcome back to the final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, we talk Bigfoot. We talk UFOs and the correlation between the two with guest Jeanette Latulipe. That starts at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time. We want to welcome in everyone on our terrestrial stations tuning on in on the United Public Radio Network, live on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. Good to have you with us. We're also live in the home of the Walking Dead. WQEE 99, Rock the Key down in Noonan, Georgia. Love having you guys with us. Thank you so much for staying up late in Georgia to spend with us. We're also live in Las Vegas on Renegade Talk Radio as well as on Revolution Radio. Remember, the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com. And donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Ultimo Genitor. Ultimo Genitor is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, because Bill sets the password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Hey, if you're a social media junkie like I am, make sure you follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. You can also, during the show, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to communicate with us as well, like John and Chris are doing right now. You as well, Deb. We see you there. We welcome in everyone in our chat rooms. You can go on to our plethora of chat rooms to follow this show as well. You can tune us in on TuneIn, download our shows from iTunes. We're also on RadioGuide.fm, TalkStream Live, and on Stitcher. Our website is SpacedOutRadio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including joining the SOR Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month. You can also... Read up on our latest paranormal news from our team of writers at The Encounter Online. And if you head on over to Patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, Patreon.com, you can become a patron of Space Out Radios for as low as $1 a month. Ian Holt and Mike Kuchiak join us tonight. We're talking everything horror, suspense, paranormal. We're hitting the gamut of the strange, the obtuse, and the weird. Gentlemen, welcome back. Hey, we're back. Absolutely. And we're having a good time tonight. Can't can't believe we're already two hours in. We've just kicked off hour number three here. And, Ian, it always goes so fast when you're on the show, my friend. I know. I I thought last time went fast. This time it's just zipping by. And that's the way it goes around here. I hope you're having fun as well, Mike, being a rookie on this show. Yeah, dude, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you guys are bringing me on. I, I, this is stuff that I could talk about all day. <laughs> well, literally you do. For what your career is, literally you do. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was telling Ian during the break, it's like, I, you know, he's like a cooler, right? I don't know, it's like, hey, dude. I can talk about this stuff all day, all day. I love this stuff. I my my entire life is about the horror film, and uh, and, and and almost nothing else. <laughs> it's like I can definitely talk about it all day. And what what's fun is you know like I last time I was on I said you know once you get your first movie made, you know it's easy to cheat because you start gathering people around you that you trust and respect their opinion and think the same way you do. So when you write a script, you know, you kind of, it's a commune kind of thing. When you like Cooch and I produce, he gives me notes on my script. I give him notes on his script and we make our stuff better. So it's, it's not just you sitting alone as a writer in a room and only your ideas. It's becomes, you know, a commune of people that know this stuff really well that Bill, we get excited. We're like, well, what if this happens? Oh yeah, we could do that. Yeah, and this goes yeah, on. yeah. And the scripts build and build and get better and better. And that is one of the great joys of film. But it's also why so you know once you make a film, you make a lot more films. It's harder to get your first film made than your second and your third because you're you're working with people that you trust and know. Let's yeah, get, is one of those people. Hey, let's get into the. I, I, oh, go ahead, Cooch. Sorry. Oh no. I was about to say, I, I mean, uh, the, the 
extreme value of, of Ian's input on Death Metal, for instance, was the fact that, like, like I, I was approaching you from a very um, uh, logical place. And uh, Ian was like, it has to be about uh, the love story, you know, between these two characters. It has to be about the, you know, the needs and the wants of these characters and that, 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 that. And, uh, you know, the, the original version of the story was very, really, uh, like, uh, well, you know, this guy wants to do this, and that's, you know, that's what's going on. And, and, and he was very much bringing in uh, the heart. You know, if there's a heart to death metal, uh, it's because Ian Holt brought it in. Because uh, I personally have a cold, you know, lump of coal of a uh, heart, and it's... <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 it's not my first urge, you know. Uh, I mean, there, but but I, end of the day, I when we make this movie, I mean, there there are beats in which, like, uh, I mean, if you're moved to tears, is because uh, you know, breathe that life into the you know, the relationships that we can, between these characters, yeah. And it, you know, it, it, it's it, we had a conversation after the first the rough draft, and yeah, yeah, Mike yeah. Mike was putting on his director's hat, and his visuals mm-hmm. were incredible. Mm-hmm. You know, you're talking like horrific, you know, paintings of of nightmares. You know, and um, that was the director, the visual director in there. I, I'm my director of the beauty. I'm going to show what I can do. But you know, right. you're so focused on that, you're you're, yeah. you're missing the characters. Like uh, like with complaints about Yonder Bond and 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 Ridley Scott in their early films, they were too visual mm-hmm. and not enough characterization. Mm-hmm. You know, and that that's a, that's when you know you need your you need your partner. Just like when I was Mike's notes on Unhinged, you know, were all about the. You know, like when you write, sometimes you get you see things like you think it makes sense because it makes sense in your head. You know, Mike is always catching me on. You know, I see it, but the characters need to to see to say it because you just that you know that may not make sense to a wider audience. And you know, he you know I'll I'll skip over stuff. I'm always cutting words things and all of that and he's like oh you need that here you need him to say why here that needs to make sense here you know and and um and that's you know the analytical versus the passion and you know you never see you know what you see in your head it does not always translate onto the page and that's what Cooch has always been great about with editing with me you know going all the way back to when we started was he was able to say what what needs to be there and what doesn't and that's a that's a great skill to have you know especially for telling a story to make sense i think that i mean if you're going to have a good working relationship at a creative level uh i mean you you have one person who throws out ideas and yet and you have another person who reacts to those ideas if that makes sense and uh and, and 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 i was able to function for you on that, I mean, in that way on several projects and, uh, and vice versa, I mean, you definitely brought that, you know? So it's like, I mean, it, it, it's very much a creative symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it really is. You know, it's like Rocky yeah. said to Adrian, I got gaps, you got gaps together. We fill gaps. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Let's talk yeah, about the important, gentlemen, let's talk about the importance of music when it comes to horror. Because there's a lot of talented artists out there in the music genre that are looking to freak people out as well. Two that come to mm-hmm. my mind right off the bat, or three, Ozzy Osbourne back in the day, although I don't think, I think hmm. he was too stoned or drunk to actually know he earned that title. I think of, I think of, I think of Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper is probably the most classic, but if you want to get a little bit closer, there's Guar, Rob Zombie, and Ramstein, and now we look at uh, Avenged Sevenfold, they're kind of going that way as well. Why is, why is horror music 
kind of well, coinciding I, I, with 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 uh, rock and roll. Let me jump in with this. I, I will say that I mean, Death Metal in particular is a film that's reacting to the fact that not all horror movies, uh, horror fans are fans of metal, but all fans of metal love horror movies. I have never met anywhere ever someone who loves metal who didn't also like horror movies. And it's it's weird that there isn't that much more of a a, a crossover. So Death Metal, I mean, the product that we're working on right there is all about, you know, traversing that entire thing. It's about making a movie that uh, will take the themes the ideas from uh, uh, from death metal uh, album covers, from death metal uh, songs, and putting them into a film. And um, I mean, overall, though, I mean, music is about I would almost say, you know, sound. I would say is about two thirds of horror. Uh, I had the wonderful experience of watching The Shining, a movie you know that that we were just talking about a second ago. Uh, I've seen this movie you know, a hundred times. And uh, the fest holiday season, I had the wonderful opportunity of watching it with my aunt, who uh, is older than me, and, uh, and, and, and her nephew, who's, you know, 18, 19 years old. So, uh, you know, I, I can get a vastly different experience. And uh, when they came to the scene in which Danny is looking up at room 237, uh, both of them reacted with the fact that it's like, uh, the scene is only scary because the music is, is scary. If you right. were to take away the sound, if you were to take away the music, it would just be a kid looking at doorknobs, you know, but the, the sound is, is completely telling you, that this is a scary situation. And um, I think that that is core to the human experience. And it's also very core to what uh, horror brings to, you know, cinematic audience. There's also a psychological reason for it. I don't know if, you know, anyone out there is a a fan of uh, the uh, 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 National Geographic Channel's brain games, but they did a whole episode on this where, going back again to when we were in animals in the jungle, our, our response is triggered orderly by our, what we hear. Cause we, our eyes are not made that we can see so far into the forest. We can't, we don't have like heat vision or something or night vision where we could see. So we have to listen. So the, why movies like Jaws work where you hear that dun 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 that's an audio cue that something's coming. So we're already in suspense where our ears are pricking up. There's something out there in the woods. And then if you notice Halloween is not gory. We're not afraid of the gore. Just before no, the knife yeah. comes down, you hear that real gore. Real gore. And yeah. it's the, yeah. right. Yeah. And it's the that gets you before Michael pops out with the knife. That's the big scare. It's the audio response. So the music and the sound of effects mixing are what creates the scares, the real scares, in the horror film. If you watch the horror film with the sound or something jumping out, it's not that scary. Turn up the sound, mm-hmm. watch it again, it scares the hell out of you. So mm-hmm. the music is so important to the story. I mean, Look, the Halloween theme. Why, why do we, why, you know, one, two, Freddy's coming for you. You know, we remember these mm-hmm. things. You know, I mean, even the sound, even the music of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre was recorded based on mm-hmm. sounds from a slaughterhouse. He went into, they went into a slaughterhouse, recorded sound all day, and then turned that into musical notes. And that's the soundtrack the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which fits the movie I mean, and creates those screaming, you know, animals sounds in the, in the, in the score. Yeah. And, and per Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I, one of the most wonderful things about that film is the, uh, the existence of the, the, uh, outdoor generator, uh, because right. the, uh, 
because that thing creates not only a, a sense of tension, but it also creates a sense of geography because if it's soft, you know that the characters go away from it. And if it's loud, you know that they're closer to it and also closer to the house and they're closer to danger. You know, it, 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 it's a very naturalistic way to let the audience know where the characters are. I and mean, it's like, I and mean, within horror, you know, visuals are one third, maybe. The majority of it is music and sound. And, you know, heavy metal has always been, from Ozzy going all the way back to its origins, mm-hmm. has, and rock and roll too, has always been counterculture. It's always, especially heavy metal, it's a way for kids to rebel. Same thing with gangster mm-hmm. rap. It was a way for people to rebel. And when you get to horror movies, horror movies operates outside the movie system. It operates, the, for the most part, as the same way as porn does. We have our own horror awards. We have our own horror genres and subgenres, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. And, and it's counterculture because they're not movies. Like, yeah. like Uch said, they are theme park amusement rides. They don't have deep characterizations. They don't work on the same character development arcs that you see in regular films. You just get a little bit of why the person's there, a reason for them being there, or a reason to like them, and and a challenge they have to overcome, and then it's straight up about the scares. Like, perfect example of a perfect script for a horror film is Don't Breathe. You set up mm-hmm. that they rob houses, you don't like them, and then you find out the girl's being little sister's being abused like she was, and she needs the money to get away, so she robs the house, you have feelings for her, they go in the house, and all the scares start. That's it. That's the whole setup. It's horror movies are simple setups like the Batman roller coaster. You're going to chase the the uh, Joker at the front of the car all the way through these tunnels and things, or Superman. You're going to fly through the air and all of that. It's the same. It's the same thing. So we don't. So by loving heavy metal, you also love horror because it operates. Even though they're made by studios, but it's still like throwaway movies they're they're money grabs but that's how the studios look at them they they but, a cheap uh, way to get teenagers I mean, into a theater yeah i mean it's also uh there, there is also a, you know metal and and horror also you know share a a, a core band passion because i mean it's very rare that a metal band can even make a living and you know, kind of the same way that you know, horror fans will 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 get behind a film that um, might not be huge with a, uh, a a mainstream audience, but it's like this is ours. This is you know, this is important. Right. This is mine. And you know, when you bang your head or you 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 light up your phone or you're thrashing your hair, it's a communal thing. Yeah. It's like the movie experience of horror is a communal thing. Exactly. Also, yes, yes, yes. Yes. It, 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 and it's a communal thing, and it's also a very primal thing. I, I, I mean, whether you're right, like, uh, you know, like, screaming, yeah, whether you're screaming in a theater with a group of people that you don't know, or, or else you're dancing. in a mosh pit, or you're in a mosh, mosh pit, pit exactly. and you're, and, and, and it's very primal, but it's also communal. And it's also, and it's I don't want to say we're the leadest, but it's also like ours. It's ours. You know, and we're, as a teenager, in we're in the theater. We're making it right. happen, and, you know? And as a teenager, you're angry. You're angry at your parents because you can't go out on Saturday night and you're grounded. You're angry about, oh. you, you You think you're old enough to run your life, but no one will let you. You know, and you get your aggressions out when you listen to heavy metal music. It's, I hate the world and everything in it, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. And, then, and then when you see horror movies, you know... Heavy metal kids are kind of sometimes either popular or they're sidelined in high school. You know, they're sure, the weirdos, yeah, yeah. you know, and yeah, you get yeah. to see the popular kids get killed first. It's always the nerd that survives. The good girl. That yeah, survives. The, 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 the one yeah, who's I, not I, the popular, I mean, the popular people get I mean, killed first. So you sit there and you're like, yeah, I get, I hate those kind of people. Yeah, they pick I mean, on me in school. Sure, it's like, I, I, especially when it comes to uh, metal as a whole and, and death metal in particular, I mean, it's really not for everybody. It's really for a very particular set of people who enjoy this music. And, I, and, and due to the fact that the people 
who make this music, uh, also have day jobs. It, it almost becomes like kind of a secret society. It also becomes like a they live situation where it's like the guy who drove the tow truck and the guy who is a paralegal are uh, both right, and it plays into band. it plays yeah. into the shining story. Well, you know, when yeah. I used to, when I had for a brief time yeah. when I had nine to five jobs, I'd get on the train on Long Island and mm-hmm. take it into Manhattan, and you'd see all these people sure. like looking sure. miserable that they're up early in the morning and they hate their jobs. And I always think, you know, what would they be doing if they were allowed to do what they loved? You mm-hmm. know, and that's kind of the point of The Shining too. You get angry at society and and your life for a lot of reasons you hate your job you're not making enough money whatever it is you think you should be doing better and you see these horror movies you yeah. get out your aggression and when you listen to the music you get out your aggression you know do you think yeah, or, every construction oh, worker yeah, wants to break yeah. his back five days a week you know for a bunch of I rich mean, people building expensive houses when they can't afford them I mean, or or a car dealer who's selling, you know, Lexuses and Mercedes and they have to drive a Chevy, (laughs) you know? Yeah. When when it comes to metal, there's a fight club element to it. Almost specifically, I mean, given the fact that, like, I actually had to spend, like, a couple of grand on dental work because I fractured a tooth in a Fear Factory mosh pit at the Whiskey uh, a couple of years ago, and I fractured the tooth, and uh, it took me a little while there. I, I don't replace that tooth. It took me $2,000 to, to get that made. And I, I mean, yeah, there's a fight club element to horror, in a way. Uh, you know, because uh, you know, not everybody likes us, but it's like, you know, the people who do like it are kind of bound together by the fact that, like, yeah, we're going to involve ourselves in, you know, something that on the face of it is kind of negative. It's gone. It's horror. We're going to yell boo at you, you know, but we love it anyways, and we're going to move along with it at the same time. You know, there's a mosh fit element to horror. There is a horror element to death metal or metal as a whole. You know, I mean, there's so much crossover between the two that it's bizarre that we haven't seen more of it. But that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're doing. Man. Well, look at, know, look so. at Friday the 13th. You know, Jason is a mm. deformed kid who was picked on, you know, and when he pops up on a lake and grabs the girl and we see his face, what he looks like, it changes mm-hmm. everything. It sets up part two and all the other movies, everything that happened. We kind of like Jason. Because these people are the kind of people that picked on him as a child. So the people he killed, and when he goes after the one person that wouldn't have picked on him, that's when we root for that girl. So we understand. For a very very long time, horror was in a ghetto of teenage boys. And it wasn't until um, the uh, Shyamalan did... Uh, what the fuck was that name? Um, Six Sense. Yes, it wasn't until Six Sense that Hollywood was able to rebrand horror as supernatural thriller. That it right. was able to rise up out of that, and uh, you know, you know, for good or for bad, because we have a lot of very weak horror movies due to the fact that they're bucketed as supernatural thriller, but at the same time. We also have horror movies that are able to actually make money and attract stars and attract uh, screenwriters who tell actual stories. So, but horror again, also started the home video market. I mean, when mm-hmm. when when Maniac came out, it was rated X, mm-hmm. and the kids couldn't get in. Yeah, sure. I remember the first night. It, yeah. First night, local theater here in Long Beach. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. showed up all my friends and my mom and my dad was dropping mom and dad were dropping me off to go in with my friends and they wouldn't let sure. us in because of all the controversy. So my mom mm-hmm. got out of the car and took in like 40 of my classmates and took us all in because she was the adult taking us in and we got to see the movie. Uh, but once I that happened, it. once that happened, the gore factor of Tom Savini and what he was doing and Rob Bottin and all these guys, what they, the gore factor led to 
the microwave massacres. I dismember mama and all these all movies right, that yeah, came yeah. out in the, where I worked in the video store, they came out in porn sized boxes. So the pictures of the gore on the back were what was selling it, the movie because gore was in today. We have sure. everything PG 13 sure. for a wider audience. And they're learning with movies like get out. It's not the, the rating. The people will come if it's scary. You know, that's, well, that's the, I, 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 it's wonderful that you just, that you just touch on get out because the fact, I mean, a while ago I touched on the idea that, you know, horror is most impactful when it's touching on the raw nerve of, of an exposed tooth of, our social interactions with, uh, you know, be- between us as human beings. And uh, I mean, the best horror movies are the ones that are really touching on something that we actually are concerned about. And I'm talking about Friday the 13th, uh, Night on Elm Street, Get Out. You know, it- it's really a film that's, that, that we haven't touched on these years in a wide audience Manner, and that's why I mean, this movie has made a hundred million dollars and more, not by accident, by any sort of imagination. And, you know, and it's, it's, really, it's a uh, social commentary, yeah. you know. I, I mean, it's putting you in the in the in the eyes of a black man going to an all white place. Now, as yeah, a white Ian, person it, who DJ, it, it's not. Yeah, it's not the fear and. A social commentary. It's the fact that it's a so, social commentary is what makes it an effective fear. If right. You get my you know, it's like, yeah. I mean, I remember when I started DJing, you know, in in college, mm. and okay. Um, okay. Well, my partners were black, and I went to an all black party out in, in uh, Brownsville, which had a you were the token white guy. Yes, and I was the only the white guy. guy in the place. Now. 15 minutes in, it was great. I was comfortable. Everyone was having a great time and nothing mattered. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But right. first time walking into that basement in Brownsville, it's supposed to be this bad neighborhood. And you think, mm-hmm. you know, there's murders there. You hear about it in the news all the time. And you go in apprehensive. And, you know, mm-hmm. that social awkward fear that you're not in a social place that you're used to is yeah. recreated so effectively in Get Out. Mm-hmm. And having experienced it from the other side... You, yeah. you, you, the realness of it in the movie opens a whole new door to horror. You know, a lot of times, exactly. like I said, yeah. we've been bound by the conventions. We, we can be original, but within con- the conventions of a, of a horror paradigm, the structure okay. of okay. the film. Yeah. It, this yeah. opens yeah. the door and okay. says we can move beyond that now. We can go to new places. And, and mm-hmm. if you look at this movie, it's still a house a guy comes to a house in the woods, right? It's mm-hmm. still the basic paradigm yeah. of a horror film, but within that, it's not just the originality of the killer or how the killer kills, but it brings in themes and commentary. Like for mm-hmm. death metal, you know, it's, it's about, you know, the things that we make fun of or don't believe in, you know, mm-hmm. what if they're real? You know, and how yeah, does that yeah. affect you? Yeah, right. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I, I mean, it's not like you know, it's the same I, I mean, thing. The main lead with... character does doesn't believe in anything, yeah. and then when he sees yeah. it, he's forced to deal with it. You know, and yeah. that I mean, that was the kind of the thing. idea that I, I, I mean, Death Metal starts from a place where they are, um, you know, their their you know their core fears are I, ideas of uh, of being useless of being meaningless and uh you know as musicians as as, as just people that they would just be uh uh amongst forgotten the yeah it's, it's the exactly. it's the theme song for the show for the movie fame i want to live forever i want uh, people to remember my name <laughs> i want fame i mean that's i, I mean it's that's corny but that's literally true for people, you know, that, that any, seek this anybody out. Anybody in death metal would laugh at that idea, but it's absolutely 100% true. You're absolutely right. Because I, I, and there, there is no money in this music. I mean, the best that you can do is to break even in this type of music because it's purely for people who are within a very core culture. And so it's, why would you sell your soul 
to be, you know, to, to advance yourself with this thing that's not going to make you money, that's not going to X, Y, Z, and ultimately it has to be for immortality, you know. And, and, if, and you, just, if you corrupt that desire, if you corrupt any desire, then you can have within yourself a, a basis for a horror film. Yeah. Well, if, yeah, right. And I, all I, this stuff I, 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 is, is we... Wait, 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 wait. The, I, I, Just to loop back around to The Shining very quickly, yeah. you, corrupt, you corrupt the urge for Jack Torrance to be a good father and now right. you have a horror film. You corrupt right. the, uh, the urge for uh, uh, Ellen Burson and the actress to be a good mother. You know, right. you corrupt good things, and that's how you find a horror movie. You know, and it's what we talked about last time. Be careful what you wish for. Absolutely, you mm. want to see yeah. a ghost? Yeah. You want it? You want to know about demons? Yeah. Well, when you actually confront them, you know, having mm. co- had mm-hmm. conversations mm-hmm. with Lorraine Warren, you never want to confront an inhuman. You never want. Absolutely it. not. You know, and and. What happens when you do? You make fun of demons and you go to horror movies and we laugh and we enjoy ourselves. But when we actually confront them like they do in death metal, because they don't believe in it. And when it, they court it at the same time, and when it co- happens, mm-hmm. what, what happens to you? Which ties sure. back into yeah. Dracula the Undead. What is the nature of evil? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. is, is yeah. wanting fame above all else truly evil? Is, is, is selling your soul to the devil truly evil? Or is it, is it what the, the price we pay for fame? You know? Um, I mean, yeah, there's always yeah, a price I mean, for yeah. everything. I mean, if we're talking about Dracula, I mean, I mean uh, specifically, I mean, uh, you know, within that story, I mean, you address the idea that uh, the desire of this character is to protect his people. And that is a laudable notion. We can all get behind it. And how do we corrupt that? And we corrupt a laudable idea, and that's how we find horror. You know? Right. The nature of evil. Uh, you know, Dracula, mm-hmm. you know, killed the welfare state. He said to, he had, there was the historic Dracula. He asked the entire welfare state, he invited them to a big dinner, and he asked them, would you die for your country? Because he knew the Muslims and the Turks the Ottoman Empire was coming with a 300-man invasion force, and he didn't have a standing army. So mm-hmm. he asked, because he didn't have the money, and he said, would you die for your country? They all said yes and cheered, and then he ate, he ate the food, and he killed all of them, wiped out the welfare state, mm-hmm. and used that money to create a, a, train a standing professional army. And with 40,000 men, he defended the gateway to Christendom and stopped the Muslim invasion. And if he hadn't been there, we would all be Muslims today. There was no mm-hmm. coordinated effort by the Christian countries or the Orthodox Christian countries to fight this. He stood alone. And for that, the mm-hmm. Pope made him the captain of the Crusades. So he was ordained by the Pope. But from our point of view today, killing the welfare state is sick and brutal and twisted. You know, how did he scare off yeah. the Muslims? They were, they were, they, yeah. He put up, he took all the prisoners and impaled them, created the 40,000 man forest of the impaled. And I stood on that ground and Mm -hmm. he would watch, look Mm -hmm. out from the tower. And he, when the Muslims came, the, the Sultan was so afraid of Dracula. If he could do this and kill all these people in this way, how could you fight a man like this? This is a monster. I can't fight him. And he took his army and went home and he had the, he had the took over state where this happened was the capital of Wallachia, which is now Romania. He had captured the capital because Dracula retreated, and he didn't enter the capital because he was so afraid of Dracula. So we can look at it and say, God, what a horrible man. But from the Romanian's mm-hmm. point of view, he's their George Washington. He saved their country. So mm-hmm. what is the nature of evil? You know, that is the big question. What we consider evil is always written by the victors. You know, this story. Was Satan evil because he gave us knowledge and free will? Original sin, we call it now. But we yeah. would be naked sheep, you know, mindless sheep in the jungle, you know, right. in the garden, 
you know, without him. So that, is that truly he the, uh, give us free will uh, to choose uh, evil or not? Yeah, will we truly be happier as uh, pets in God's aquarium? You know. Hey guys, I want to yeah. ask. I, I want to ask a couple of questions here because we kind of sure. got to- off topic with the whole music genre here <laughs> in, in regards to to the horror aspect. How much does music make the movie? Especially when it comes. I, I mean, the f- most famous. Let's be honest. The most famous is that that stupid trombone or 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 uh, tuba going da na da na da na with John. Oh, what about what about Halloween? That's a viola. Yeah, we hear that music. We know Halloween. That horror, horror is built on sound. Horror is built on sound. Is I would say between two thirds and three fifths sound. Um, the rest of it is imagery, and whatever exists between those cracks is acting because we need for the characters to be realistic that that we can identify within them but by and large it's the visual and your sound your sound is a massive proportion of that and uh, I mean Death Metal is all about that is core to the central plot of the film uh, but I would say I mean it's not Special, I would say that is extrapolated to uh, to all of the best horror films, uh, or or series like about, Stranger Things, when they brought back the all, themes of Tangerine Dream and John Carpenter, yeah, and it yeah, was such exactly. a successful soundtrack. It reminded people that the theme that we hear in horror movies is part of the story. I would say that it's I not mean, just it an after effect. On, it comes down even to the individual moments. Um, I would offer an example that, uh, uh, you know, if you're looking at, uh, for instance, uh, Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, the first film. Uh, right. When the ringlets appear, there's always a screech, there's always a howl, there's always a thing. And as far as, uh, you know, they're, they're putting a dentist drill under the appearance of these characters. So when they appear, the audience uh, automatically reacts with a, a little bit of a cringe. And, and um, I think that, you know, that applies to everything that is fighting within film. Um, well, take an example, George. Really, when we first meet it, Quinn, it, it, right, we're, we're unsure uh, of him yeah. because that screech along the chalkboard mm-hmm. mm-hmm. sets him mm-hmm. up as an anti-hero right from the beginning. Is he good? Is he right, bad? What yeah. is he? He doesn't want, he won't, he, you know, he's not going to let the boat turn around and go in. He's not going to go back for a bigger boat. He's not going to put on a life yeah, jacket. Yeah. All those things yeah. about him, you know, he's obsessed. He's not a yeah. hero. He's an anti-hero. And that screech yeah. of announcing him the first time we see him is an audio cue to wa- be wary of this guy. We're, we're unsure of him. And that makes yeah, his we, character we, we, so we. interesting. We we immediately establish the fact that he is willing to break rules in a way that makes us uncomfortable and maybe not like him. Yeah, you know, because he is willing to screech his nails across his chalkboard and he's also willing to like buzz up the radio. And you know Right, and when he comes out of the smoke with the bat and smashes the mm-hmm. radio, get certifiable, mm-hmm. Quinn. I mean that all yeah, yeah, yeah. builds until the point he tells the Indianapolis story, and you understand why he is the way he is, and you get behind him. That's why when he dies, you right. go, "Oh my God, that's Quinn!" You know, but you I, know that was a public would, death in the movie. I would say that there there are two main sources of truly memorable pieces of cinematic music, and those are action movies, and those are horror movies. Because yeah. I know one, I, I know one will be like, oh yeah, I, I totally remember the being too. And there uh, are dangers in that. Yeah, there are dangers. I, I, like the I, I, like if you've I, ever I, seen I, Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins, the theme music you, yeah, yeah, is, is yeah, yeah, incredible yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's more exciting than the movie. 
So you hear the music, you get all pumped up, and the action doesn't yeah. live up to yeah. it. The movie yeah. is not that good. <laughs> so you have I mean, to, uh, when you do the score, it has to fit the movie. I, I mean, here's the thing. It's like uh, Spielberg has made many wonderful films. But I, I, mean, I would dare you, if you would put a gun to someone's head, Dare you to uh, hum the uh, the themes to uh, 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 Schindler's List, you know, or yeah, David exactly, Private yeah, Ryan? Like, but you can yeah, hum exactly, the theme to close exactly, the counters exactly. and Jaws. We're, we're, uh, we're talking about, um, you know, Jaws, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th. Yeah, and these are very identifiable themes. And uh, that was actually something that, that became lost along the way in horror. Uh, it, it, I, 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 you know, tried to hum the theme to uh, Blair Witch Project or Saw. And these are very effective uh, films and franchises. They're good, you know, but I mean, give me the theme. Well, the theme from Saw and, is excellent. Charles Cloud did an incredible it, it job good. with that. I, I, I mean, this is good music. I, I, I'm not putting it down, but I mean, if you were to ask anybody to go, you know, hum the theme the saw, you what is the percentage chance of that happening? Whereas if you're, well, you know, you go, know that oh, oh. also yeah. is a product of of you know the music business, where sure. like you know, yeah. I know what you did yeah, last yeah, summer yeah, gets yeah. a bunch of cool bands to sell us to sell a soundtrack because they know for Halloween in these movies. There was money in the soundtrack, yeah. but it's just music. Yeah. So to yeah. sell the yeah. bands yeah. Yeah. now, to sell yeah. their bands, they put the bands on and they choose pieces of pop songs or rock songs, and right. it's not. And they fit it into the movie instead of crafting the score, to the movie. And what you know happens is right. like you listen to the soundtrack. The Crow is a perfect example. You listen mm -hmm. to the soundtrack of The Crow, and it's all these bands, and it's a great score. It's a great soundtrack. Yes. But yes. if you pick up the I, score, I, 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 the, the, the music in that the is not... The creates a great score. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yes. But the, the, the score album is actually just as good as the soundtrack, because when you hear that music, you know when The Crow is coming. You know the mystery. Mm -hmm. You feel the mystery and the suspense of it. The... the, the mm -hmm. The Randall, uh, I said, Poser was his name. Randall Poster was uh, who did the score. It was, it's just fantastic. I remember, but, yeah. You know, it's it's not, um, and and that's a movie where the soundtrack and the score work together. To get, you know, mm -hmm. the success of that score led to horror movies becoming all about the score and the band. And you know, I think with you know Stranger Things and Get Out and all this stuff. We're getting mm -hmm. back to more of creating a score for a movie. You know, it's memorable. You know, I sort mean, of. the greatest horror films always have a memorable score. And they're not just... Virtuous. Also, there's yeah. an expense. Yeah. Yeah. You know, why do I need I, a yeah, yeah. Sound track guy, get a music supervisor, and do a bunch of uh, uh, drone sounds, and deep right. bass yeah. 12. Yeah. You know, and that's a soundtrack, and it's not like that. It doesn't it work. Like that. Uh, I, I, the soundtrack, you know, the pop songs chosen for, uh, for instance, um, Lost Boys, the original version, uh, very much act as a soundtrack for that. Uh, the soundtrack, you know, the, the songs chosen for the original um, Friday Night act as a right. soundtrack for for that, you know, because they're uh, as identifiable for those films as, for instance, the actual soundtrack for, say, Poltergeist. Uh, but even even movies hear, like The Terminator you, you, used bands that we didn't know. They used bands that had a song that was right, even if we've never heard of them. Like, you know, there's well, so many songs I, I, on Lost Boys that we don't know these people and never had another hit. But, well, I mean, you take Lost right Boys. Yeah. soundtrack. You take Lost Boys, though, guys, and In Excess was all over that, <laughs> okay. or, or ACDC during Maximum Overdrive. You know what I'm saying? There right. was all, but they yeah, fit. Yeah, they, yeah, fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they fit. Today, what happens when you do a score is the record, the studio that's releasing the movie has an aff affiliated record label 
who's got the next song, big, who's the next big band records released, and we're going to take a song off that record and fit it into the movie instead of finding the song that fits the movie. That's where the problems come in. So you get, you get a score with bits and pieces of songs or only heard in the closing credits for no reason. It doesn't fit the movie at all. It's just there to sell a soundtrack. So they're actually preying on the disposable income of, of fans, young fans, who, are, who get money from mommy and daddy or have no expenses from the newspaper route or their, their uh, afternoon yeah, yeah, school yeah, true, yeah, yeah. True that. on a soundtrack. I, I totally I mean, agree with that. But sometimes, just sometimes, the movies miss the mark. I mean, you look at the Dirty right. Harry soundtrack that that True. contained in yeah. 1987, "Welcome to the Jungle" by Guns N' Roses, and it didn't yeah. take off. And then you look what happened to it's that album. Ridiculous! Yeah, it, it took off to be the best-selling yeah, album in the world. Zipper and do the original, one of the greatest score say, artists I, I, in the history. I, I listen, guys. I, I will say this: I, in the specific case of Death Metal, it's a movie called Death Metal is within everything that I have to lean into it. This has to be a soundtrack of death metal. Uh, and if I veer from that left or right, uh, I will fail the film. You know, it's a movie about a death metal band. It's a movie called death metal. It has to be a death metal soundtrack from top to bottom. And anything that I do that fails that, is going to be a failure of the film uh, uh, as a whole. And so, I mean, the film now, creates the doing a score in for death metal situation. Yeah. Is when, Dan Gushman. The, the, yeah. I, I mean, who is the Dan, lead singer for Adrenaline and a uh, two time yeah. Grammy winner back to back that, that uh, Emmy winner, excuse me, back to back that holds the record on that for yeah, his commercials and, and, that he's done. And he is absolutely one, fantastic. Yeah. And here, here's a wonderful thing about this project is uh, Dan Gutschmidt, uh is a multi Emmy winner. He's an extremely talented guy, and he is 110 uh, percent devoted to the project. Uh, he has been nothing but absolutely fantastic to the entire film. Uh, he's bringing to him uh, a very classic horror soundtrack, uh, right? And the idea being that that will be the the spine of the entire thing, and that death metal will be everything else. You know, the brain, the heart, the body. You know, that's that. You know, so it's now like, we're uh, doing we'll a. Have a oh, I'm sorry. We're I, doing. I was say, okay. We're do, go yeah. ahead. No, so I mean, we're doing, we're, we're a, doing a, a combination of like a classic, very classic horror uh, soundtrack a theme, and then around it will be the death level is what happens. Right. And, you know, we're also doing a movie called Dead of Night, which is mm-hmm. being directed mm-hmm. by the actor Christopher James Baker, who's out with his wife on his, their anniversary tonight. So happy anniversary mm-hmm. to, to you, mm-hmm. too. Um, and Christopher James Baker starred as Reverend Harm, James, Harmon James in The Purge Election Year. And as we discussed the soundtrack, because it has to do with paganism and pagan gods and stuff, we wanted something tribal in it because it's in the woods and all the stuff, woodland gods and stuff. And, you know, we looked at, I worked with Dan, we looked at soundtracks, we came up with Wolfing, one of the, you know, early uh, James Horner soundtracks, which had a very tribal, yeah, a very tribal beat rhythm in it. You know, so while we have the horror sounds, he's crafting this tribal, ancient kind of sound, like this Celtic, you know, with Celtic influences that James Horner always used, because, you know, these demons, these gods come from the Celtic mythology in in, in Ireland, what was once, what was, it was Brit- Britannia then, but today is mm-hmm. Ireland, Ireland, and it's the Celtic traditions and the music of that period but what we think the music of that period is, is that kind of tribal, you know, demonic beat, you know, and it fits the, the score. And James, you know, Christopher James Baker is just, you know, crafting it to to fit what the story is with, with me and Dan. And, and, and it's just, it works great when you have, 
someone as talented as Dan who could do anything from classical music because there's a classical music music component to uh, death metal oh, yeah. as well as death metal music. <laughs> Dan is and, fantastic. I, I, I yeah, he can do Dan anything. Is absolutely one hundred percent fantastic. You you know what the best moment in Wolfen is is when they take that dude's head off and yeah. his mouth keeps moving. I can't I imagine. An, I don't remember another horror film in which something like that happens, in which uh, someone gets their head cut off and the the face keeps moving. And that's actually, there's all these reports of that happening during the sure. uh, French yeah. Revolution at the guillotine. Yeah, I did. So that, yeah. that's where they got that I, from. I, 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 it, it is both a wonderful horror beat. It's also a wonderful expression of excellence, uh, the makeup effects, or uh, yep. the, you know, just practical effects. Before CGI, real practical makeup effects. When, when, which is when, when they take, yeah, when they take that dude's head off and his head keeps mouthing stuff and reacting to stuff, that is pr- probably the best moment of the entire film. And it's an and excellent film. And for unhinged, don't get me wrong. Yeah. We're working oh, yeah, with yeah, yeah. Keith Shockley of the Bomb Squad of Public Enemy thing. Sure. And mm-hmm. for the, you know, you know, there are a couple other projects out there called Unhinged, including the remake of the 1983 movie. We talked about changing yeah, the title, yeah, which we yeah. could because Unhinged is so part of this movie. These people, you know, psychotic, mm-hmm. unhinged, or are they psychotic, sure. whatever. You know, yeah. all of that ties into the anger and rage of the villain, you know, this go or this person yeah. who was killed has come back for revenge, maybe, right. or is it yeah. all in the head of the person who killed her and she just feels guilt. So we don't know, mm-hmm. but all the characters become unhinged in the course of the right. story of right. what they're right. dealing with. So that sound effects that will go over the score, you know, to create that nails on a chalkboard, screaming mm-hmm. unhinged madness, you know, to it. Where you know where Keith comes in and talks about more of a jazz kind of feel to it, where he's bringing jazz into a horror right. score to create that right. disconnected music feel with the parts over it, allows the music to let you into the story, the feeling, the the feeling you're not settled at any point in the movie. Mm-hmm. So we're using the yeah. music to create an unsettling feel through the whole movie because the jumble of the music, the jambalaya, is going to put people mm-hmm. on edge. And that's, that's, that's part of the score. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Keith, I love has, it. you know, yeah, as a, as a fan of jazz and, and, and hip hop and the beats and all that, and all the, you know, he's in the hip hop hall, he's in the rock and roll hall of fame, you know? So he yeah, knows yeah. music like that inside and out, and he's able to pull stuff from different, you know, recording arts, something like this or something like this, a little, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it becomes this madness. You then the madness is in the music and that's, Mm-hmm. That's what makes Unhinged work. When when it's finished and it's shot, you lay that over it, and it's another level of taking you into a mood and a feeling and an unsettling atmosphere that heightens when the scares come, you're already unsettled. So when the scares come, they're actually bigger, and that's the beauty of what music can do in a horror film. Love it. Gentlemen, we we got we got about a minute left here. This has flown by. Okay, Ian, why don't you tell us when your next movie, Unhinged, will be coming out, and tell us what you're up to. Well, I'm working on right now, Unhinged, which will be shot in June and July, and hopefully, it'll be out early next year. We're also planning on shooting Death Metal and Dead of Night Mm -hmm. uh, this summer. And we have a big documentary on the early days of Public Enemy coming out when they were known as Spectrum and how they got started and what, why they became political and why they decided to do um, political rap instead of the party rap like, you know, the Beastie Boys and LL Cool J were doing at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's... uh, it's it, it, we got a nice slate for this year of films coming out. So I hope you'll all uh, join us, even for the ones that, the one that isn't hard, the documentary when uh, when sure. Reagan when Reagan killed Roosevelt. Yeah, dude. Mike, thank you Should so much good? for joining us as well. You guys, hold on. Got to keep you quiet for just a couple of seconds because I got to wrap this thing sure. up. Okay. 
If you're listening in on the Spaced Out Radio side, you hear Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking us on out with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Tomorrow night of the program, we head into the skies and the forest. We're talking the connection between Bigfoot and UFOs with Jeanette Latulipe starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. I hope all of you join us as well. It's going to be a fun time. Remember, you can catch this show and others on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can tune us in on TuneIn, download this show and others on Night iTunes. We're also on RadioGuide.fm, TalkStream Live, and on Stitcher. Our website is SpacedOutRadio.com. You can check up on the encounter online, join the Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month, or head on over to Patreon.com. And become a patron of Space Out Radios for as low as a buck. You can do it. I want to say thank you to WQEE 99 Rock the Key and the United Public Radio Network on 107.7 FM in New Orleans. Our terrestrial radio stations as they rock us out every single night. I will be back in 21 hours from now. I hope you will be too. I appreciate you doing this, man. Always a pleasure to broadcast to you live, and I will see you all tomorrow night. Do me a favor, my friends. Spread the word. Tell a friend. We're here every night. Mr. Bumblefoot, take us home.